It's the summer of 1881, and the notorious desperado Billy the Kid has been on the run from the law for several months. Despite the best efforts of the brave sheriff of Lincoln County, Pat Garrett, his posse, and even the United States Army in July of 1881, they are no closer to finding the elusive Billy the Kid than they were when they first started. As the story goes, Garrett thought that the kid would have headed to Old Mexico, so he chose not to look in the most obvious place that the kid would have gone to, which would have been Fort Sumner. Now, Walter Noble Burns, in his 1926 book, says that just after the kid's escape, Garrett got together a posse of a dozen men, and they set out to recapture the kid. Among those posse members was former Sheriff George Pepin, who knew the kid very well. And Pepin suggested to Garrett that the posse should go to Fort Sumner because he thought that that's the first place the kid would go. But Garrett refused. Now, here's how Burns records the conversation with Garrett and former Sheriff George Pepin. He says, quote, Pepin told Garrett, I got an idea the kid may hole up in Fort Sumner. No chance, retorted Garrett. Fort Sumner's only 90 miles. The kid's no fool. He won't hang around so close with posses raking the whole country for him and knowing that he's going to swing if he's caught. Well, that's just it, Pepin answered. He might calculate that you'd think just that way. No, the kid's too smart to take a chance like that, Garrett said. Well, if you don't aim to look for him in Fort Sumner, I'd call it mighty smart for him to go there. He'd be among his friends. Well, that's true enough, Garrett said. He's got plenty of friends there, but I don't know that he'd trust them. That there's a big reward out for him, dead or alive, and money has been known to turn friends. Well, what's more, persisted Pepin, he's got a sweetheart in Fort Sumner. Well, what does the kid care about sweethearts, Garrett replied with scorn. He's thinking to no know sweethearts. He's figuring right now on saving his neck from the noose. And I tell you, he's riding hard for the Rio Grande. His only hope is Mexico. Well, you're bossing the job, said Pepin, and that settles the argument. So Burns' book continues, westward out of Lincoln rode Sheriff Garrett and his posse, gaunt, hawk-eyed men, bronzed with weather, six-shooters jostling in their scabbards and sun flashing on rifles. Their hunting field, New Mexico, their quarry, a slender youth, five feet eight in his boots, hidden somewhere out in the vastness of deserts and mountains. They followed the kid's trail without knowing it to the point where he had turned off into Baca Road towards Fort Sumner. As Garrett had thrown Fort Sumner out of his calculations, they kept on going west. Spreading out, they ransacked the mountain coverts around Fort Stanton, where the kid once had a rendezvous. They passed out of the hills and scoured the Carrizozo Plains and beyond. They beat across the ghastly, gleaming chaos of the white sands. Far and wide over the somber lava desert, which an ancient crater spread across the eastern slopes of the Oscuros, a black wilderness of jagged iron rocks sentineled by weird cactus shapes, they circled and quartered like foxhounds questing on a cold trail. They whipped the wild ravines of Chupadero Mesa. They searched among the ruins of the Gran Quivera. Turning south, they passed through the Three Rivers country, traversed the Jornado del Muerto, explored the canyons and valleys of the Oregon Mountains, and came to the end of a bootless hunt in Mesilla. Not a clue had they found. Not a word had they heard of the kids' whereabouts. So weary, discouraged, and bedraggled, they trooped back to Lincoln, end quote. Okay, so that's Walter Noble Burns' account of Pat Garrett and his posse looking for Billy the Kid. So it's the summer of 1881, and where, oh where, could Billy the Kid be? Pepin had said that he was probably in Fort Sumner, and when they followed the kid's trail, sure enough, it went along a path that someone would take to go to Fort Sumner. But then again, it was also a road you could take to go to other places, too. So when they got to the point where you would normally turn on Baca Road and go into Fort Sumner, they kept right on going and looked everywhere else, but they couldn't find Billy the Kid. As a matter of fact, not only could they not find Billy the Kid, but according to Burns, they didn't hear a single word about him being anywhere else. Got it. So weeks and weeks pass, and it seems that Garrett and his people had looked everywhere, but the wily Billy the Kid kept eluding them. It was even said in the Austin Statesman on July 26, 1881, that Lieutenant Neville and his army troops had been out looking for the kid and had looked across the Texas border into Paco City, but so far they hadn't been able to find him. Other newspaper articles talk about how Governor Lew Wallace, concerned that the kid may be after him, was getting up and practicing with his pistol every morning at 7 a.m. sharp, 
just in case the kid came for him. So obviously, this was a big deal, and it seems like there was an all-out search to find Billy the Kid. And everybody was putting in a lot of serious work and effort to find him. And perhaps, if there was any consolation at all to Pat Garrett, maybe it would be that the kid was no doubt feeling the pressure of pursuit and having no rest at all while on the run. His steps being dogged constantly by the ever-persistent lawman and his posse at every turn. Certainly, the kid must be getting tired of sleeping with one eye open and having to move from town to town every few days as he sought to shake off the law from his trail. No. In reality, the kid was sleeping just fine, chilling in Fort Sumner, just like George Pepin had said. He was pretty much living without a care in the world. And after killing Ollinger and Bell and escaping the Lincoln County Jail, he had pretty much gone straight to Fort Sumner, or at least the area around Fort Sumner, and had stayed there the entire time even going to dances with friends and living it up publicly. But of course, Pat Garrett had no way of knowing this. Poor Pat and his posse and the army were traipsing all over New Mexico looking for Billy the Kid, when all the time he was just 90 miles away in Fort Sumner, where Garrett had lived, by the way, and where Garrett had been married, and where Garrett still had relatives. How ironic, how tragic, if only someone had given the poor sheriff a clue of the kid's whereabouts. And yet, the facts of history are that Garrett was indeed given not just one, not just two, but many clues that the kid was in Fort Sumner. And yet, he still refused to go there. Now, why would that be? Well, we don't know. But what you should know is that on June 2nd, 1881, more than a month before Garrett finally goes to Fort Sumner, the Kansas City Evening Star reported that the kid using the name William Bonney had at one time subscribed to the Las Vegas Optic newspaper, and he had asked that that paper be sent to Fort Sumner. Huh, a clue. Very interesting. So the kid at one time, not that long ago, was having his mail sent to Fort Sumner. I wonder if that means that he might go back there. Should we look? Nah. That's too obvious. All right, I get that, actually. I don't mind that Garrett says, no, it's too obvious he's not there. I get it. After all, it's only been a month, and they haven't looked everywhere else yet. Got it. But wait, there's another article, this time on June 16th, 1881. The Daily Picayune newspaper in Mississippi publishes a story on Billy the Kid, where they tell the good people of Mississippi all about the outlaw. Mississippi was over a thousand miles away from New Mexico, so these people probably knew very little about Billy the Kid. So the newspaper gives some relevant details, such as, quote, with a Winchester rifle, he, the kid, can shoot as well as with the gun on his side, without apparently taking any aim, as most men can shoot in the usual way. His equal for the quick and unerring use of firearms has never been known in New Mexico. End quote. So, the Daily Picayune, a thousand miles away, has learned a little bit about the kid and is bringing the population of Mississippi up to speed on the details of who he is and what he's all about. Really good with a gun. He shoots from the hip as well as somebody can shoot looking down the barrel. So they talk about how good he is with the gun. And then at the end of the article, they say, oh, by the way, quote, it is believed that he is now in the vicinity of Fort Sumner, he having a sweetheart in that locality. End quote. Wait, what? You're telling me a month before Pat Garrett actually goes to Fort Sumner, the people all the way in Picayune, Mississippi, a thousand miles away, knew that the kid was in Fort Sumner, and they were broadcasting it to the world in the major newspaper. Yep. Do you think maybe that would be yet another clue that Garrett may want to look there? Nah. Why would you do that? That's crazy. But there's more. Charlie Seringo says in his book that someone named Brazil, which would obviously be Manuel Brazil, of the Wilcox Brazil Ranch, which is about 12 miles northeast of Fort Sumner, sends Garrett a letter in early July saying, wait for it, kids in Fort Sumner. So let's recap. Kansas City Evening Star knew the kid was in Fort Sumner, or at least knew he was getting his mail there. The former sheriff of Lincoln, Dad Pepin, 
who knew the kid well, had as his first thought the idea to look in Fort Sumner. The posse had followed the kid's trail out of Lincoln, and it headed them towards Fort Sumner. And now Manuel Brazil is telling them that the kid is in Fort Sumner. But Garrett still doesn't want to go to Fort Sumner. Wow. Garrett must have been pretty convinced the kid wasn't in Fort Sumner, huh? But even so, do you think maybe, even though he didn't think he was there, maybe check it out? Or maybe at least send a letter to his sister-in-law and ask her, is the kid there? I mean, that would make sense, right? It's not that far. So comparatively speaking, it really wouldn't take much time, especially if you just sent a letter. I mean, it's already been two months almost. So it's now been two months and you've looked everywhere else. And you have multiple sources all saying the kid is hiding in Fort Sumner. So wouldn't you round up that big old posse of yours and maybe even get some of those army soldiers and go check it out? Nah, not going to do it. So Garrett, for months, continued to avoid going to the town of Fort Sumner to look for Billy the Kid. But thankfully, according to Walter Noble Burns, as fate would have it, John W. Poe had a chance run in in White Oaks with an old, worthless drunk named John Graham. And here's what Burns says about it. He says, quote, there dwelt in White Oaks a certain George Graham, who was living out the age-old tragedy of a drunkard. He had once been a man of substance in Texas, but drink and dissipation had played havoc with his means. He had gradually slipped into the depths and was now a down-at-the-heels derelict, making shift to exist as a hangers-on around White Oak saloons and gambling halls. In more prosperous days, he had known Sam and Dan Dedrick, who kept a livery barn in the mining camp. Since what few coins he managed to scrape together went for whiskey, and he had no money to pay for a bed, they permitted him, out of charity, to sleep in the haymow of their establishment. One night in July, two months after Billy the Kid had escaped, Graham crawled into the hay and composed himself for slumber. He was just dozing off when he heard voices in the livery office. He pricked up his ears. I don't know how Walter Noble Burns knows that he pricked up his ears, but the Dedrick brothers were talking together. They exchanged confidences. Evidently, in the silence and seclusion of their livery barn at midnight, they felt no fear of eavesdroppers. For the moment, they had forgotten the derelict stretched in the hay. What Graham heard startled him into intense wakefulness. He became suddenly aware that he was the possessor of a dangerous secret, and the thought troubled him. For hours, he tossed in nervous restlessness. How the hell did he know that? For hours, he tossed in nervous restless, restlessness. <laughs> this is what historians do. Like, they try to make it a better story. And, like, you know, when they left Lincoln that day, they clucked their tongue and said, yeah, horse. Like, you don't know that he said, yeah, horse. Whatever. And then, God forbid, you you try to, uh, you know, follow a hypothesis and do some research. So they say, oh, you made that up. All right. But he tossed in his nervous restlessness for hours. Anyway, it was not until the small hours of the morning that he was able to fall asleep. Standing on the street the next day, Poe was speculating idly on the enigma. It's such an enigma. The enigma of the kid's disappearance. Like, where could he possibly be? We've only had like 20 people say that he's probably in Fort Sumner. But he's, he's speculating idly on the enigma of the kid's disappearance. Garrett, it seemed, was right. The kid by this time was doubtless safe across the border in Mexico. Well, at least he wouldn't be coming back to harry the Canadian river herds. And Poe's employers were as well off as though the kid had been hanged. But then a trampish man slouched by. Poe rested a casual eye upon him. He had no idea who the fellow was. But from the looks of him, he didn't care to know. But to Poe's surprise, the seedy stranger flashed him a look of recognition and, with an almost imperceptible motion of the head, tipped him a signal to follow. Hmm. Here was a mystery which at first glance did not seem intriguing, but Poe followed. First to the edge of town and then on a little way into the country. Some random like homeless dude's like, hey, gives you a little kick of the head and you're like, let me follow this homeless bum across town and then out into the woods. What a brilliant idea. Anyway, Poe followed first to the edge of town and then on a little way into the country. <laughs> he follows a homeless dude into the woods. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> All right, this is history for you. Walter Noble Burns, baby. The Saga of the Billy the Kid. This is the best book. This is the authority. And I don't see any end notes in this freaking thing either, by the way. 
um, as I was recently criticized for not providing uh, academic formatting to my to my work. Uh, anyway, at a point in the road screened from observation by pinyon trees, right? Because, you know, nobody saw him walk out there. So once they get there, you better hide behind a tree. The vagabond turned and faced him. Do you remember me? He asked. Ho, after a moment's scrutiny, shook his head. Nah, I don't know who you are. George Graham, the homeless bum said. Oh, yes, answered Poe. Back in Tuscosa, of course. How are you, George? Well, I'm down and out. That's how I am. It's no use to tell you. You can see it. What's the matter, George? Poe said. This is what drink has done to a man who was once a fairly prosperous citizen. But I didn't bring you out here to tell you my troubles. You were my friend in Tuscosa, and I have news for you. I know what you're here for. The mysterious fellow was talking in riddles, and Poe wondered if his misfortunes might not have unhinged his mind. But, Graham added, I'd be killed if I was ever found that I told you. You must give me your word that you'll never mention my name. Poe promised secrecy. Graham looked in all directions from behind the freaking tree that he's hiding in the woods. This is pretty ridiculous, but anyway, Graham looked in all directions to make sure that no one was in sight. All right, he said. Here it is. Billy the Kid is in Fort Sumner. The words gave Poe a thrill. What makes you say that, he asked. Listen, you know the Dedrick boys. They've been friends of Billy the Kid for years. The kid used to hang out at their ranch over in the Bosque Grande country, and whenever he came to White Oaks, he made their livery stables his headquarters. Last night, when I went to bed in the haymow, I overheard Sam and Dan Dedrick speaking about the kid. They know where he is. They said he's been in White Oaks since his escape in Lincoln. White Oaks? It, said, it actually does say White Oaks in the book, but I think he means Fort Sumner. Poe smiled incredulously. I'm telling you what they said, insisted Graham. Believe it or not, the kid they said has been right here in White Oaks. They kept him hid in their livery barn several days. What do you think of that? And you walking past the barn a dozen times a day and within a few feet of him. But ever since he killed the guards and got away, the kid, the Detrick said, has been hanging around Fort Sumner. Expects to skip to Mexico sometime soon, but he hasn't gone yet. He's in Fort Sumner now. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. I guess he went to White Oaks, and then from White Oaks, he goes to Fort Sumner. Got it. So Paul Harley knew what to think. The information was, according to Burns, at least impressive. What you tell me may be true, he said at length, but it's hard to believe. However, it may be worth investigating. Here's a dollar for you. Go buy yourself a few drinks. Well, that's nice, you know. You know, if you're an alcoholic, yeah, let me help you out here. Go get some more drinks. So Burns continues, quote, Billy the Kid was betrayed for a silver dollar by a rum-soaked bum of the boozing cans. Four drinks of whiskey, according to the current quotation in White Oaks bars, was the price paid for the secret, upon which his life hung as by a hair. Poe walked in on Garrett in Lincoln the next day. I don't believe it, said Garrett. Neither do I, replied Poe, but let's take a chance. Huh, Garrett rubbed his nose reflectively. Well, we'll go, but I warn you, this is just another wild goose chase. All right, so that's the end of what Walter Noble Burns says happened when a dirty old bum walks up to John Poe and says the kid's in for summer. All right, so now here we are, just a few days before Garrett finally agrees to go to Fort Sumner. And I'm not sure if the whole world knew that the kid is in Fort Sumner or not, but certainly the people in Kansas knew the people in Mississippi knew, George Pepin knew, the Dedrick boys knew, Manuel Brazil knew, and even this old drunk bum George Graham knew. And now Garrett knows. And even better than that, John W. Poe now knows that Garrett knows. So again, maybe this is just me, but I'm starting to think that pretty much everyone knew that the kid was in Fort Sumner. And at this point, it's getting pretty suspicious to everybody that Garrett keeps making excuses not to look there. But this raises an interesting question. If Garrett knew, or at least had a lot of reasons to believe that the kid was in Fort Sumner and was still avoiding Fort Sumner, why wouldn't he want to find the kid? You know, a lot of people over the years have said that Garrett was in on the kid's escape. They point out that not only had Garrett and the kid been good friends in the past, but Garrett was conveniently absent from Lincoln when the kid escaped. Not only was he absent, what he was doing on that day was something the sheriff would have normally sent a deputy to do in normal times. And these were not even normal times, but you had the hanging of the most infamous outlaw coming up in just a few days. And yet Garrett leaves town. Furthermore, over the decades that have passed since the kid was supposedly killed, 
Many old timers believe that Garrett had let the kid go. And some say that he even gave the kid the money to escape to Mexico. All of this and much, much more is in the period newspapers and other accounts. What's also in the record is that Garrett was quoted as saying, quote, it would have been better if the kid would have killed me, end quote, which you could read a lot into that statement. What I personally tend to believe it indicates is that he wasn't thrilled with becoming a public figure. Old Garrett was involved in a lot of shady stuff before becoming a lawman, and those shady things become pretty near impossible when everybody knows who you are. So, I mean, I can understand that someone could take Garrett saying, quote, it would be better if the kid would have killed me, end quote, as meaning he would have rather faked his death and changed his name than have to be the one who helped the kid fake his death and change his name, leaving Garrett behind to be scrutinized. But nah, that's crazy conspiracy talk. He couldn't have meant that. He couldn't have meant that he would rather be the guy that faked his death and, and lived on in anonymity instead of Billy the Kid. <laughs> that's silly. All right, so let's get back to the story. As we can see from multiple sources, Pat Garrett knew everybody was saying the kid was in Fort Sumner and just, for whatever reason, did not want to go. But too much time had passed and too many people were saying it. And so ultimately he had to go. So what does he do? Does he saddle up that big old posse of his and call in the army and go try to get the kid? Nah. Does he talk to Dad Pepin and say, you know, I think you might be right. Let's follow up on your hunch and go there. Nah. Instead, history tells us that he takes a guy he just met who had never seen the kid before. And he also takes another guy who had never met the kid and had never seen the kid before. And the three of those people head off to Fort Sumner. Okay, I guess that's one way to do it. But does anybody think that's maybe a little bit suspicious? When you've checked everywhere else in the in the state and you've got the army and you got posses and you're running all over looking for him, but now you're going to look at the most obvious place where everybody says the kid is, even newspapers from a thousand miles away, and you're like, ah, just a couple of us go. Yeah, just me and you. Yeah, let's just let's just do that. But that's what history says. They say the three guys headed to Fort Sumner. But did you know that there was another guy that was supposed to go to Fort Sumner with Pat Garrett and John Poe and Kip McKinney? Absolutely. It's in the historical record. If you remember, he got a letter from Manuel Brazil. Well, Garrett responded to that letter and he sent it back to him and said, OK, meet me at the mouth of the Taiban Arroyo. So he was going to meet Manuel Brazil, 14 miles east of Fort Sumner. And Brazil was part owner of the Wilcox Brazil Ranch, which was 12 miles northeast of Fort Sumner. So wait a minute. You could go 12 miles northeast or you could go 14 miles east. Why wouldn't Garrett just go to his ranch? Well, that's a good question, but there's also a very clear answer as to why. Because at one time, Billy the Kid was at the Wilcox Brazil ranch, and Pat Garrett sent a note there saying to the kid, hey, come meet me in Fort Sumner, but he didn't sign it as Pat Garrett. It was a trap. He sent the note as if the note was sent by one of Billy's friends, and the trap worked. Billy the Kid and Tom O'Folliard and his buddies came in, and that's the time that Garrett killed O'Folliard. So there was a lot of chicanery going around. There was a lot of uh, deception, and there's a lot of passing notes and stuff. So when Garrett gets a note from Manuel Brazil that says, hey, the kid's in Fort Sumner, Garrett says, okay, you say the kid's in Fort Sumner, then you need to come with me to go get him. You're going to send me a note that says, then you come along. You have to risk getting shot. You have to meet us and you're going to come with us. So Manuel Brazil doesn't show up. I guess he didn't want to be in on that posse. So now does Garrett go to his ranch? Nope. He probably thought it was a trick. And when Manuel Brazil didn't show up, he probably believed that's exactly what it was. Okay, so now I'm starting to see how this game was played back then. So now I have a question. If that's how the game was played, then why wouldn't Garrett use that same tactic with worthless old George Graham and White Oaks when he came to Poe and said the kid is in Sumner? If Garrett was being consistent, he would say, okay, dirty old bum George Graham, you say the kid's in Fort Sumner? Then you need to come with me to Fort Sumner and you need to see if the kid's there. And you need to risk getting shot just like Manuel Brazil needs to risk getting shot. But he didn't do that. And maybe that makes sense because, you know, Walter Noble Burns told us that George Graham was just nothing but an old washed up drunk sleeping in the hay. Garrett obviously wouldn't want somebody like that to come along 
on his posse. So I guess he just decided to go check it out by himself with his two deputies and hoping that Manuel Brazil would show. You don't want a drunk coming along because, you know, he'd be a liability. So I totally get why he wouldn't say, oh, you think he's in Fort Sumner? Great. You come with us and you show me. Okay. Got it. So you got the three lawmen going to get Billy the Kid. First, according to Burns, Garrett and his new buddy, John W. Poe, ride more than 50 miles to Roswell, New Mexico, and they pick up Kip McKinney. Then, that evening at sundown, the expedition starts from Roswell. They head towards Lincoln to avert suspicion as to their destination, and then 10 miles out, they turn sharply to the north the way that Fort Sumner lay. They rode till midnight when they picketed their horses and slept on their saddle blankets. The next day, they traveled 55 miles and camped for the night in the Sand Hills, six miles from Fort Sumner. From there, they sent John W. Poe into town, and he scouted around. He asked for the kid and was met with a lot of suspicion. He then went to Milner Rudolph's house, who covered for the kid, who also acted very suspicious, but covered for the kid and said that he wasn't there. Finally, Poe reports back to Garrett and tells him that everybody in town is on edge and acting suspiciously, and he thinks that the kid is there. Garrett says, well, all right, let's go to Manuela Bowdry's house, because if the kid's in Fort Sumner, he's probably with Charlie Bowdry's widow. Now, remember, Garrett knew very well that the kid had a sweetheart in Fort Sumner, because that sweetheart was his own sister-in-law, Celsa Gutierrez. But Garrett says, no, let's go to Manuela Bowdry's house. Okay, I mean, you got to pick some place to go first, right? I mean, I'm sure that that's just one place they're going to check. They're going to check the whole town and make sure he's not there, but you got to start somewhere. So let's go to Manuela Boudry's. Totally got it. So off they go. And after watching Manuela Boudry's front door for two hours, Garrett says, okay, that's enough. He's not here. Let's go. Actually, according to Burns, his actual words were, quote, I had no faith in this trip in the first place. I'm willing to bet the kid ain't in Fort Sumner and never has been since his escape. We'll go back to our horses now and start for Roswell. It's best to put a little distance between us and Fort Sumner before daybreak. So wait, what? So they had spent a couple days getting there. And then within a couple hours watching a single door in town, Garrett says, I'm good. You guys ready? I mean, can we go? Now, I don't know what exactly was going through Poe's head at that moment. But I would imagine it would be something like, I just told you everyone was acting suspiciously and we've only been here a couple hours and you're asking me if I'm ready. No, I'm not ready. Of course I'm not ready. Why are you so eager to leave? But hey, that's just me. What exactly Poe thought or said, we don't know entirely, but we do know that according to him, he suggested they go to Pete Maxwell's house and ask him. Garrett again doesn't want to go and wants to leave, but finally gives in to Poe. But isn't anybody curious why Garrett was so eager to leave Fort Sumner once he got there? I mean, is it possible that the suspicion of the early residents of Lincoln and Fort Sumner that he was in cahoots with the kid were true? What else would explain his strange behavior that night? And why exactly had he chosen these two guys to come with him? Two guys that had never seen the kid before when he had so many other people available and could have even gotten help from the army. We don't know. But Garrett eventually listens to Poe, and they go to Maxwell's, and you know what happens next, or at least what they say happens next. And we've already talked about that for two hours at this point. And you may think that we've beaten that horse to death, and there's not a whole lot more to talk about. But nope, it keeps getting better, baby. Believe it or not, we're just getting started. You see, the people over time in history that have tried to control the narrative overplayed their hand by saying that dozens and dozens of people attended the kid's funeral. Now, I've pointed out over and over how the critics for 140 years have said, nobody ever questioned Pat Garrett, nobody questioned the sheriff, which is obviously a lie. But what I'm going to tell you, you can look at this headline right here and see that people have been questioning Garrett since before you were born and before I was born. As a matter of fact, and I know they say it doesn't matter, but John W. Poe questioned the sheriff within 60 seconds of shooting the person that he shot. Anyway, I'm going to use a chapter out of their book, and I'm going to tell you that other than Walter Noble Burns, who doesn't give any source or any validation at all of what he says, nobody ever claimed there were dozens and dozens of people at the funeral. And if you can tell me if I'm wrong on that, but from what I see, there's no corroboration at all in the historical record that would support that statement. There is, however, one little data point that someone sent to me that these people have found that apparently, along with some mental gymnastics, is what they use to say 
that more than 100 people, maybe more than 200 people, were all there at the funeral of Billy the Kid, and they all saw the body. And I'm going to share with you how they get to that number. I'm also going to share with you why I think the way they're doing it is totally and completely illegitimate. So here we go. In Walter Noble Burns' book, he says, quote, Francisco Medina, 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 who lives on the ranch of Don Manuel Abreu, dug the grave. You're going to see later, a lot of people said they dug the grave. The hearse was a rickety old wagon drawn by a pair of scrawny Mexican ponies. Not six people were left in Fort Sumner during the funeral. The entire population, men, women, and children, turned out to do the kid last honors and followed his corpse to the little military seminary a short distance east of town. So that's something Burns wrote. Like, he couldn't sleep and, you know, his ears pricked up and he rolled over and over in the hay because he couldn't fall asleep because he was so excited. There's no source for this at all. I'm pretty sure that Walter Noble Burns made it up. There's no corroboration at all. So, all right. But what do I always say? When you look at the actual evidence in the historical record, it never, ever, ever says what they say it says. On June 24th, 1927, we are told that none other than Delovina Maxwell sent a private letter to J. Evitz Haley. It simply says, quote, most of the native people who live in town went to his funeral, end quote. Most of the native people who live in town went to his funeral. She doesn't say that anybody followed the body to the cemetery, and she doesn't say every man, woman, and child. She said the Mexicans in town went, which Pose describes as a wake that happened right next to Maxwell's house. There was no funeral at the cemetery. People have this image of a graveside service because that's customary today, but there's no record at all that that's what happened with Billy the Kid. None. And if there ever was, there would be a record of it. They would say the preacher did the service and something. It didn't happen. There's no evidence anywhere that would indicate that's the type of the funeral that was had at that type of scale. So, depending on what you think by, quote, town, you can just go to the census and count the people in the, quote, town, and there you go. Now, this basically gives you a license to print people, because you can go to as many areas around Fort Sumner and grab all those censuses. So, there's really three census-designated places uh, around Fort Sumner. There's Sunnyside, there's Cedar Springs, there's Fort Sumner, um, and so you can grab as many of those people as you want. You can get to over 200 people just by saying, hey, the whole town, that's everybody within a 100 mile radius. So you got hundreds of people there. Now, we've already talked about how Fort Sumner had 15 buildings and a handful of people in the quote town. Um, so did she mean the whole town in the sense of 10, 15, 20 people? Um, or is it, you know, 200? I don't know. But regardless, you can't argue. Delavina does say, the kid was dead. And she would know, right? Supposedly, Delavina was one of the kid's girlfriends. It said that she did his laundry. She fed him. Her little belito. My little belito. But let's use common sense. The reason that police today separate eyewitnesses and ask the same questions over and over in different ways when they do their investigations is because if people are lying, their stories don't add up. And they will also change their answers over time because they can't remember exactly how they lied the last time. And in the case of what happened in Fort Sumner on July 14th, 1881, you will see that in regards to all of the stories of everyone present, the stories do not add up and the stories change over time. For that reason, you will see that even if we agree that Delavina's comment should be interpreted to mean that the entire state of New Mexico was at the funeral. It really isn't going to matter because it's a single data point that has to be compared to many, many, many other data points. And we have to weigh her comments versus all of the other people's comments that are also recorded. I mean, does Delavina Maxwell's comment carry more weight than Pat Garrett or Jesus Silva or John Poe or any of the other many witnesses that supposedly were there? Many of these statements of these people contradict one another. So they can't all be true. Somebody has to be wrong. Somebody has to be lying. So the smart people have to make a choice about who's the most credible. And they do make that choice. As far as what I've seen, 
their choice is to anoint Delavina Maxwell as the most credible witness. Like I said, they'll tell you she's one of the kid's girlfriends. She did his laundry. She fed him. She would have no reason to lie for him. So since that's the case, why don't we see what else she had to say in this very same letter to J. Everett Haley? I mean, she's the source of truth, right? I wonder what else she had to say. In that very same letter, she says, now listen carefully, that she wasn't there the night that Billy the Kid was killed at Pete Maxwell's house, and that she didn't see the body until the next morning. Delavina's exact quote is, quote, the story is told that I was there, and I went in with a candle to see if Billy the Kid is dead. I did not do it. Pete took a candle and held it around the window and Pat stood back in the dark where he could see into the room. When they saw that he was dead, they both went in. Billy did not go to Maxwell's house often. I did not see Billy the night after he was killed, but I saw him the following morning, end quote. Holy smokes, the most credible witness in the world and the ultimate authority on what happened the night Billy the Kid was supposedly killed by Pat Garrett says she wasn't there that night. So I'm sure... All of the honest historians and researchers are going to mention that when they quote this letter, right? Well, you can go back and get their books, and you can look for yourself. And I think what you're going to find is that some people will actually pick and choose some things out of this letter that suit their agenda and completely disregard the other things that don't. Huh. Case in point. You'll recall that many people over the years have used as evidence that it is indisputable that Garrett killed the kid because Delavina Maxwell was the first person to enter the room when the kid was shot, and she recognized the body. She came in, she turned the body over, she put the pistol and the knife on the dresser, and said, okay, everybody, he's dead, it's safe to come in. Again, she's the most credible witness in the world. She's independent. She's extremely close to Billy the Kid. She did his laundry, she fed him, she knew he wouldn't hurt her. So she's the one that lit the candle and went into Maxwell's bedroom to find Billy the Kid dead on the floor. According to them, she instantly begins wailing and crying and screaming, they kill my little boy, they kill my Billy. Now, Delavina was a freaking Navajo and not a Mexican. So I don't know exactly why they always have her speaking with this ridiculous Mexican accent. Like, they kill my Billy. Like, but whatever, it makes a good story. And sadly, it seems a good story is more important than the actual history for some people. But wait, it gets better. Delavina is furious at Pat Garrett and screams at him, you piss pot, you son of a bitch. You piss pot, you son of a bitch. In every other profanity she could think, I don't have a Navajo accent, I gotta work on that. Every other profanity she could think of. I mean, it's such a dramatic event. It has to be true. You can't deny that passion. You know, I, you, he, they had to kill the kid because look at the impact it had on those that were closest to him. Are you telling me that Delavina was such an amazing actress? She's going to fake that emotion? You know, the tears? What are you, an idiot? She That was real, man. That was real. That was passion. No. What I'm telling you is that none of that happened because Delavina herself says she wasn't there until the next day. And those words, are definitely attributed to Delavina Maxwell, not Paulina Maxwell. But hey, while we're on the subject, if you want to know how Paulina Maxwell reacted to her boyfriend being dead on the floor, we can turn to none other than the account of John W. Poe, who says that he was surprised at how little emotion Paulita had upon seeing Billy dead on the floor. I mean, it would almost be like she even know the guy was laying there. That's that's ridiculous. Like, you know, that didn't happen. Of course she knew him. She was just so shocked, you know. She didn't show any emotion whatsoever. Come on, man. Come on, man. As usual, under scrutiny, the whole fake narrative that has been weaved together as support that Garrett killed the kid falls apart under scrutiny and evidence and makes no sense. I mean, it, it is a slam dunk. But it's a slam dunk that Garrett didn't kill him. I mean, remember the 300 hostile Mexicans, all armed, that wanted to kill Garrett, but instead changed their minds and drank beer with him at the funeral? It's cool, man. I really like that little guy, man. But 
that's all right. Yeah, it's good. Come on. Poe had repeatedly said how hostile the town was towards him, that everyone was armed, that he feared he would be attacked. But then a switch flips and all the angry Mexicans are now pacifists and want to party at a funeral with the murderers of their friend. Is that the most logical option? Was this a Twilight Zone episode? So anyway, in 1927, Delavina Maxwell goes on the record to correct a false historic statement. She says, quote, the story is told. I was there and I went in with a candle to see if Billy was dead, but I didn't do it. End quote. Her letter is very clear, but amazingly, that part of her statement, the most important part, is literally ignored by some who call themselves academics and historians. And then these same people who repeat the lie that she was trying to correct while twisting her other comment to suit their agenda without disclosing to the public that's not what it says and that she said she wasn't there, it's completely shameless. Just go look in the bibliographies of these books. See if they reference this letter. I think you'll be surprised at what you find. Now, I understand it is commonly accepted in academia to fill in the blanks to tell the story. I told you about the guy who says when they captured the kid at Stinking Spring, the wagon master clucked his tongue and said, giddy up, horse, or something like that. I don't care about that. Obviously, we don't know what the guy really said, but it's not really critical. It's fine. You got to paint the picture of history. You got to make it interesting. So for all we know, the guy may have yelled, yeehaw, or go horse, or whatever. But we can assume he took some kind of action to get the horse moving. I personally think that's fine. We don't know for a fact he clicked his tongue. Anyway, I personally have no problem with it. But some people take this as license and go way too far and say, well, you know, Kathleen Bonney was married in Ireland to Mr. Bonney, and they fled the potato famine coming to America, and her husband died on the cross-Atlantic voyage, and blah, 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 blah. And there's no evidence for that at all. There is no Kathleen Bonney. Plus, it's Catherine Antrim. There's no Kathleen Bonney. There is no Bonney. Bell Starr gave Brushy Bill Roberts, Billy the Kid, the name Bonney, and that's where it came from. There's no genealogical record, and there never will be. But they'll take McCarthy with an H, they'll find a family in New York City with all the Irish Im immigrants at the time, and say, oh, here he is, uh, McCarthy. There's newspaper articles talking about, oh, yeah, Billy the Kid's from New York. We knew him. He's burned from head to toe with acid. He's disfigured, but that's him. So why do people say, oh, I was there. I knew. I saw him. And yeah, he's my friend. Because they want to be relevant. Everybody puts themselves at the scene of the crime, at the scene of the story. They want to be relevant. It's called human nature. So back to the point. Filling in some blanks with conjecture, exploring hypothesis is fine, but taking it way too far is way too far. But that's how people are, unfortunately. And despite Delavina Maxwell saying she wasn't there, you're going to continue to see it uh, printed in books and to say that she wailed and called Garrett a piss pot because that's a better story. But this has to be intentional, right? They have to intentionally be ignoring the fact that she said she wasn't there when the rest of what they say comes out of this exact obscure letter, which is an obscure letter, which is why they try to misquote it and say that everybody followed the body when that's not what it says. I'm sorry, my friends, but that is not serious scholarship. And if you encounter somebody like that, I highly recommend you ignore them, but that's up to you. So there you go. The smoking gun that all the people that supposedly were there used to describe in detail regarding what happened are freaking liars. Delavina says she wasn't there and didn't see the body until the next day after this single letter screws up the entire narrative that has been repeated for over 100 years, even after Delavina herself corrected it almost 100 years ago. It sounds dishonest to me, but don't give up hope yet. There is another witness, Paco Anaya. Forgive me if I say my man Paco. I like Paco. Now with Paco, some of his information comes from letters he wrote, and some come from a book that I believe his children wrote based on what he told them. Now here again, you're going to see that some people will want to use Paco because he rattles off the names of a lot of people that were in Maxwell's bedroom with the body immediately after the kid was supposedly killed. He also says he was one of six pallbearers. I mean, if you're a modern member of the Santa Fe Ring Admiration Society, you ain't going to give that up. I mean, this dude has to be credible. He talks about he, how he personally put new clothes on Billy the Kid's body for burial and that he stayed up with the body at Beaver Smith Saloon all night and he personally buried him the next day. 
He also says that immediately prior to shooting, Billy was with him chilling at Jesus Silva's house. And there was lots of people there at Silva's, including him, his brother-in-law, Eugenio Garcia, all the family of Jesus Silva, Atal Pena and family, and of course, Billy the Kid. Anaya says that although he was partying with them, Billy was not going to sleep over. He was sleeping at the home of Celsa and Sabal Guterres, so around 8 p.m., Billy bails. I always kind of wondered, did he do an Irish exit? All right, that's a, that's a little joke, right? Because he's supposed to be Irish. All right. Seriously, he bails, but he's hungry. He goes to Maxwell's to get meat and gets killed. Um, now, in Anaya's version, all of those people at the party at Silva's hear the shots and come running. And he lists them all as being on the porch of Maxwell's. Garrett, Poe, McKinney, Maxwell, Donna Luz, Paulita Maxwell, Odia Maxwell, Pedro Abreu, Pablo Baubien, Rebecca Baubien, and several other people that came when they heard Billy was killed. Wow. Wow. A lot of people. Pretty different than what anybody else says, but got it. Now, Anaya also says it, it was only 8 o'clock at night which some people said would have meant that it's still daylight because it doesn't get dark in the summer until after 9 p.m. So believe it or not, I'm actually on my man Paco's side. So let me say that again. He says that Garrett killed the kid at 8 o'clock at night. And some people have said, no, it would still be daylight. It's summertime. Okay, doesn't get dark till after 9 p.m. But as I've said many times, I follow the evidence, and this may surprise you, but we have one of these newfangled devices called a computer. So if you just take a little time and do a little research, you will find that sunset in Fort Sumner, New Mexico on July 14th, 1881 was at 7.10 p.m., which tells me it was dark at 8 p.m., and Paco is telling the truth. There's no daylight savings time back then, so... You can't put the paradigm of today back on 1881. Even if you think it's going to help discredit Paco Anaya, can't do that. It's not fair. You got to follow the evidence. So we have to do the actual work. And in this case, Paco Anaya's version of what time it was or could have been checks out. So if the kid was killed at 8 p.m., like he says, it would still be dark. I got you, Paco. Don't worry, buddy. We follow the evidence. So Paco says everybody's scared to go into the dark bedroom, but then Delavina Maxwell comes over from Donna Luz's house with a lighted lamp. And she goes in with that lighted lamp, flips the kid over, puts the gun and knife on the dresser, and then everybody goes in and sees it's the kid. Then he says, Alejandro Segura, who is there, turns to his brother-in-law, Higinio Garcia, and says, you're now a constable. I'm making you a constable. We need one and you're it. And he tells him to go round up a coroner's jury. So Higinio grabs Antonio Saavedra, Jose Silva, Sabal Gutierrez, Lorenzo Yamarillo, Paco Anaya, uh, and Negro Yamarillo. However, Negro Yamarillo doesn't want to serve as a coroner jury member. So Segura says to his newly minted constable brother-in-law, Higinio, that's cool. You can be the sixth guy. So Garrett gives them a paper that is already filled out. And they all sign it. Later on, however, Anaya said that Garrett called a different coroner's jury with some new people on it that never saw the body. He doesn't say why. Maybe the body had been removed for the wake. Everybody talks about. Don't know. But these new guys sign a new paper that Pat has Manuel Abreu write. So, wow, sounds pretty compelling. He rattles off a whole lot of names, and he says he was personally there. And, you know, this guy later on became a state legislator. I mean, he's a prominent politician. You know, politicians never lie. So he has to be telling the truth, right? I mean, why wouldn't we think Paco Anaya is credible? He was there. But let's back up to an earlier account in Paco Anaya's book and see what he says about the kid's escape from the Lincoln County Jail to see how reliable he is. The first thing that jumps out at me when we do that is that we see that he says that Billy the Kid told him that his two guards in Lincoln were, quote, two of those hired by the Murphys to steal cattle from Chisholm. These were two of the ones that most wanted to kill me because they were afraid of me, end quote. Now, it may have been true that Ollinger wanted to kill the kid. I think that is true. But it wasn't true of Bell. And as far as I know, neither Deputy Bell nor Deputy Ollinger was a cattle thief. So I find the quote from Paco Anaya to be odd. 
But he has more to say about what Billy supposedly told him. And later in his book, he says, quote, Billy told me while I was in jail previously, a lady friend from Lincoln brought me good food. And among the food that she brought me was a little tortilla of bread folded over. And while I was eating my food in my cell, I found a little knife with a white handle that I still have right here. Billy shows him the knife. Now, Billy goes on to say that with that little secret knife, that he carved a wooden key. And with that wooden key, he picked the lock on his handcuffs. And that's how he was able to get his hands free from the cuff and use those cuffs to crush Bell's skull. Well, actually, Anaya says that Billy kind of just threw the handcuffs down the stairs and it hit Bell in the head and it crushed his skull. But I'm trying to help him out here because I don't think there's enough force to like literally crush somebody's skull. But hey, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, after Billy shows Paco the knife, Paco asks him the obvious question. Paco says to Billy, and for emphasis, I'm going to use my excellent Spanish accent for this portion of the presentation. So Paco says to Billy, quote, Billy, how could you have this knife without them finding it? And you know what Billy's response is, according to Paco and Naya? Billy replies by saying to Paco that he had hidden the knife and that he had, quote, shoved it up you know where, end quote. <sighs> Paco Anaya says in his book that Billy the Kid told him that he shoved a knife up his arse to hide it from the deputies. Now to me, and this is just me talking, this proves one thing and one thing only. And that one thing is that Paco Anaya didn't realize that the kid could slip handcuffs. I mean, seriously. Like, he had to come up with a reason for the kid to get out. So he says he shoved a knife up his arse, used the knife to whittle a key, and then picked the lock. First of all, there's just so much wrong with this. These cuffs were riveted. They were riveted. Back then, they riveted the cuffs. There was no key. They were riveted on. They used a blacksmith to rivet it on. I happen to have been on the History Channel on a show that a period blacksmiths, and he made this exact same cuffs Billy had. You should watch it. It's a great show. And now, listen, I, I'm willing to follow the evidence, but I refuse to believe that the kid keistered a knife in his rectum. I'm, I'm not going to believe it. I, it's, I, I'm, I'm going to make a choice, okay? We all have choices to make. I'm going to make the choice that I don't believe Paco Anaya. When he says that Billy the Kid keistered a knife in his arse like he's in San Quentin or something. I, I, I don't believe it. Okay. I'm just going to have to take the position. I don't believe Paco and I. And what's more, if I had any hesitation about rejecting the rest of what Paco and I said about Billy the Kid, that hesitation was eliminated when I read the interview that he gave to the Albuquerque Journal on June 28th, 1926. And I'm going to share that interview with you. So here we go. Now, the headline on the paper is the member of coroner's jury in Billy the Kid inquest spikes the theory that he's alive. So Anaya's like, hey, he's dead. I was there. He's dead. AP Anaya of Vaughn slept with the outlaw. <laughs> slept with the outlaw? He stirred a knife, slept with the outlaw, saw him 20 minutes. You could really misinterpret this if you read it the wrong way. AP Anaya of Vaughn slept with outlaw, saw him 20 minutes before death, viewed body. Okay, case closed. June 27th, while some people may have given credence to the letter recently written to the State Historical Society from a man in El Paso to the effect that Billy the Kid, famous outlaw, was not killed and he was still alive in an eastern city, A.P. Anaya Avan is not one of them. Mr. Anaya not only was present in Fort Sumner at the time of the killing, but was a member of the jury that held an inquest over the body. And he also helped bury the body of Billy the Kid. There could be no mistake. Mr. Anaya says, for Billy the Kid was well known to him, having spent much of the time just prior to his death at the ranch belonging to Mr. Anaya's father, which is just south of Fort Sumner. Let's hang on to that because you'll need it in a minute. A.P. Anaya came to Fort Sumner in 1875, and it was on June 14th, 1878, that he saw Billy the Kid at that place. After that, he saw him often until December 24th, 1880. Uh, at which time Sheriff Pat Garrett, who afterwards killed the kid and had a posse, had a battle with Billy the Kid and his followers that was at what was known as Stinking Springs, near the present site of the Taibon. Two of Billy's gang were killed, and Billy and the rest of the gang rounded up and arrested. 
They were taken to Las Vegas, then to Santa Fe, then to Las Cruces, and finally to Lincoln, where Billy was tried for the murder of a man over in the Galinas Mountains, convicted and sentenced to hang on the 13th day of September, 1881. Mr. Anaya says that Billy was not guilty of the murder for which he was convicted, but that another man was responsible. On the 16th of September, just three days before he was to be hanged, Billy the Kid killed two guards at Lincoln. Do you see what just happened there? The 19th of September, three days before he was to be hanged, Billy the Kid killed two guards at Lincoln and made his escape. I thought he was killed on July 14th, 1881. He's got him escaping Lincoln two months later after he was supposedly killed. Huh. He made it across the Capitan Mountains to the north side of the range where he had friends at the Block Ranch. They gave him a horse and saddle. And he set up for Fort Sumner four miles east of Long's Ranch. He stopped at a spring, lay down to sleep, and his horse broke loose. The place is about 40 miles from the Chibola Ranch, which was owned by Mr. Anaya's father. And Billy walked that 40 miles, arriving on the 16th of September. 1881. He's got his dates all wrong. He stayed at the Anaya Ranch, and A.P. Anaya, who was then 19 years old, slept each night with Billy, who was 22 years old. So he's got Billy the Kid's age wrong, too. Up until that time, he had killed 22 men, one for every year of his life. Billy then went to Fort Sumner, stayed several days, returned to the Anaya Ranch, told Mr. Anaya's father there was a reward amounting to all of $12,000. It's actually $500. Offered to the man who would kill him, and he took out his pistol offered it to Mr. Anaya's father, telling him to shoot him and collect the reward. Don't believe that for a second. Uh, Elder Anaya refused and advised Billy to make his escape into the Plains country and finally persuaded him to do so, and finally he started out. It was on a foggy morning, however, and Billy said that he, if he could find the way, he would go to Portales, but if he got lost, he would return to a ranch where he was acquainted near Melrose. He did lose his way and arrived at the sheep camp of Pete Maxwell, in whose house he was killed. So he was trying to go and escape, and instead he got lost and went to Maxwell's. Uh, he stayed around Maxwell's sheep camp for about two months, then went to another ranch nearby and spent the winter staying there until May of 1882, when he went back of Fort Sumner, where he was killed on the night of the 22nd of June. So Paco Anaya says Billy the Kid was killed on June 22nd, 1882. Delavino Maxwell said Billy never really came around to Pete Maxwell's house. So this doesn't jive. Mr. Anaya was in Fort Sumner the night of the killing and talked to Billy not more than 20 minutes before he met his death. You'll see a lot of people say the same stuff 20, right before he died. Uh, Billy came to Pete Maxwell's house to, Gary, uh, to get a piece of beef and was carrying a knife in his hand. Garrett had gone to the house only a few minutes before looking for the kid and was in the bedroom sitting on the bed with Pete Maxwell and Billy arrived. Two men named McKinney and Poe were waiting outside. As Billy passed the two men, he said, good night. <laughs> good night. Night, fellas. Hey, what's up? Good to see you. Good night. No, he said uh, buenos noches uh, in Spanish to them and went into the house and he entered the room where Garrett and Maxwell were. Who are those fellows outside? Pete. Garrett knew Billy's voice and kept still. Billy walked over to the bed struck against Garrett's knee. Didn't hear that one before. So he's in the room going to talk to Pete and he bumps into Garrett. Then steps back a few steps and says, who is it? Garrett drew his gun and shot three times, not two times. First bullet striking Billy in the left breast and killing him. He fell face downward on the floor with his gun in his right hand, knife in his left. Hearing the shots, a crowd gathered quickly. Garrett and Maxwell had gone out and everybody was afraid to go into the room to see if Billy was dead. Finally, an Indian woman... Delavina Maxwell, who still lives at Fort Sumner, took a lamp and went in. She took the gun and the knife, rolled the body over face upward, and then called to the others that Billy was dead. Quite a number then went in. Just as the piece Alejandro Segura and panel to jury comprised of Paco Anaya, Jesus Silva, Higinio Garcia, Negro Yamarillo, and D. Serbacker. Who the heck is D. Serbacker? And an inquest was held. The jury decided that Billy the Kid came to his death at the hands of Pat Garrett. The body was then removed to a dance hall. A dance hall where it remained all night. The next day he was buried in the military cemetery at the fort. The grave is just west of the gate to the cemetery. Mr. Anaya says there are several people living at Fort Sumner who yet knew the details. Among them are Francisco Medina, Juan Medina, Mrs. Manuel Abreu, uh, Trujillo 
Santion Trujillo, D. Serbacher, Francisco Lovato, Vincente Otero, and Delavina Maxwell. Now, he doesn't mention Jesus Silva. Very interesting. And he mentions this guy, D. Serbacher, who is Domingo Swabecker. And there happens to be an article um, in the Albuquerque Journal on July 6, 1938, where Domingo Swabecker, who is 88 years old and has lived in the Fort Sumner region since the days of Billy Kidd, says he did not build the coffin in which the kid's body was buried. He did not see the kid after he was shot, and he was not in Fort Sumner at the time the kid was killed. Domingo says all kinds of reports have been circulated about him from time to time in regard to Billy the Kid, and this ought to clear them up. So hold on a second. They These guys say, oh, he was there. Yeah, he was there. I saw him over there. So all these guys are supposedly there. Delavina Maxwell. And she comes out and says, no, I wasn't. And then you have Domingo Swabacher, who Burns says built the coffin. And a lot of people say, oh, he's there. Says, I wasn't there, guys. But he mentions somebody else. Domingo says Frank Lobato and Jesus Silva, who yet live in Fort Sumner, both saw the kid in death and they know he's dead, regardless to all the stories of the contrary. So all these people, they are saying that Billy the Kid is dead. But why is it so hard to figure out who is there? One of the stories to the contrary is that the kid is yet living in Mexico in one of the unknown and remote mountain regions. I was talking to Domingo yesterday. He said he was taking care of some sheep in Texas when most of the stirring events took place in Fort Sumner. He was born in Las Vegas in 1850. He now lives in Clovis at the home of Ho Jose Trujillo. Despite his 88 years, he's hale and hearty, and his mind is remarkably clear on dates and incidents of the old days in the West. All right. So Paco and I just rattled off a lot of stuff that is way wrong. And for that reason, and the reason that he said Billy the Kid shoved a knife up his ass, I refuse to take him seriously. And and when I read his accounts, I don't know if you ever saw the film Blazing Saddles, Mel Brooks film, but there's an old prospector in church that gives a speech. And uh, at the end of the completely unintelligible speech, guy stands up and he goes, now who could argue with that? And uh, everyone's like, yeah, yeah. So that's how I feel sometimes. I got to be honest. The story is so ridiculous. It defies logic when you actually look at what really happened and what people actually said. And I know it's a lot of work, but you still get people that pick and choose snippets out of these testimonies to push their point of view and ignore the obvious and many irregularities and problems in these statements. And they say, case closed. Who could argue with that? She cried. God help you. She cried, man. So stupid. All right. So what do we do? with these recorded statements of Paco Anaya. My personal opinion is they go to the very, 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 very bottom of the pile. Below, everybody else's statements. In priority, yes, they remain data points, but highly, highly, highly suspect data points. And they certainly do not constitute proof that a large number of people saw the kid's body. Don't get me wrong. I like Paco Anaya, and I'm going to tell you why later. But intellectual honesty demands that his statements go to the bottom of the evidence pile when compared to other more credible eyewitness statements, in my opinion. But don't lose hope just yet. We still have at least one major witness, and that person is Jesus Silva. But before we get to Jesus Silva, let me introduce you to a minor witness, Vicente Otero. Not that Vince Otero, the other Vicente Otero. Yes, it's confusing. There are two Vicente Oteros. One who lives in Fort Sumner. And then the other one, that is his cousin with the exact same name, who's also in Fort Sumner the night the kid was supposedly killed. Now, seriously, this is how complicated this story is. This is true. There's a guy who lives in Fort Sumner, Vicente Otero. And then he had a cousin who was also named Vicente Otero, and he was visiting that night uh, when the kid was supposedly killed. Anyway, here's what the cousin who was visiting Fort Sumner that night says. And this story is in the Albuquerque Tribune, Monday, September the 5th, 1955. And the name of the article is Off the Beaten Path by Howard Bryan. 
And the article reads, Vicente Otero Sr. of Las Lunas has a good laugh when anyone questions the fact that Billy the Kid was killed 74 years ago at Fort Sumner. Mr. Otero talks from personal experience. He knew Billy the Kid and was visiting in Fort Sumner that fateful night when Billy met his death. He recalls visiting and drinking with the kid that afternoon in a Fort Sumner bar. When he next saw his friend hours later, he was stretched out dead with a bullet wound in his chest. Mr. Otero's recollections of Billy the Kid are not drawn from childhood memories. In fact, he was a few years older than the notorious New Mexico Desperado. If Billy were alive today, he would be 95 years old. Mr. Otero observed his 100th birthday last February. The old pioneer who has lived in New Mexico during the entire century of his life has been blind for the past several years. He is still in fairly good physical condition, however, and his mind is as clear as a bell. Mr. Otero resides in Los Lunas at the home of a granddaughter, Miss Santos Saavedra, and her husband, his son, Tranquilino Otero, I'm not going to get that right, and a large number of great-grandchildren and great-grandchildren live close by. I found the old pioneer seated in his living room smoking a pipe. See, smoking isn't that bad for you if he's 100. Um, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Can delete that. He speaks very little English. Members of his family interpret most of his remarks. He breaks into a grin when I mention Billy the Kid. Billy is just a little fellow. He didn't look very dangerous at all. They say he killed quite a few people, but he always is very nice to me. The last time Mr. Otero saw Billy the Kid alive was in Fort Sumner on the afternoon of July 14th, 1881. Otero, at the time, held a contract with John Chisholm, the famous cattle king of the lower Pecos Valley, from Las Vegas to the Chisholm Ranch, where, which was located near where Roswell is today. Otero said that each month he would drive a wagon to Las Vegas to pick up groceries and other supplies needed on the Chisholm Ranch and return with them. While making these long journeys, he usually stopped at Fort Sumner, which was on the wagon road, to spend the night with a cousin whose name also was Vicente Otero. On these visits to Fort Sumner, he often ran across his friend, Billy the Kid. On July 14, 1881, while en route to Las Vegas for supplies, Otero stopped at Fort Sumner to visit his cousin and spend the night. That afternoon, he walked into a cantina or saloon and was greeted by his friend, the Kid. Billy and I talked for a while and had a few drinks together, Otero recalled. I don't remember now what it was that we talked about. Late that night, while most of Fort Sumner was sleeping, the kid walked from a porch into the bedroom of his friend, Pete Maxwell, and was shot to death in the doorway by Sheriff Pat Garrett, who was crouched in the corner of a dark room. Otero said he was at the Maxwell home early the next morning to see what had happened. And, quote, Pat Garrett was at the door of Pete Maxwell's bedroom and wouldn't let me go in, Otero said. The door was open, though, and I could look inside and see Billy lying there, dead, just inside the doorway. They had put him on Pete Maxwell's bed, and he was lying there on his back with blood all over his chest and his feet hanging down to the floor, end quote. About that time, Otero continued another sheriff who was there, started talking about getting people together for a coroner's jury. Otero says, I didn't want to be on the jury, so I got my wagon in a hurry and went on to Las Vegas. The pioneer said it was common talk in Fort Sumner that Pete Maxwell, supposedly a friend of the kids, had sent word to Garrett that Billy was hiding in Fort Sumner. They said Billy had sent a letter to Pete saying that he was going to marry his sister, Otero recalled. Maxwell didn't want his sister to marry Billy the kid, so he sent word to Pat Garrett to come and get him. Otero says that there is no chance that Billy escaped Garrett's gun and lived for years afterwards, as some has claimed. Several years ago, he said, a man came to him and asked him to identify an old man who claimed to be Billy the Kid. Now, this is probably Brushy Bill Roberts and Morrison. I told my visitor that I would not waste my time looking at someone who thought he was Billy the Kid. I saw Billy a long time ago in Fort Sumner, and he was dead, and he can't come back from the dead. Some more of Mr. Motero's recollections of a century in New Mexico will appear in this column Thursday. All right, so there you go. Vicente Otero, the cousin, sees Pat Garrett blocking the door of Pete Maxwell's bedroom and sees Billy the Kid, not on the floor, but laid out on Pete Maxwell's bed with his feet dangling to the ground. Anyway, this guy's right there in Fort Sumner, but he doesn't hear the shots. Did you notice that? This is now the second person that 
didn't hear the shots. Because remember, Delavina Maxwell was also right there, but didn't come over until the next morning. So she either didn't hear the shots or she ignored them. But regardless, the next day, Vicente goes over and Garrett won't let him see the body. He can see it anyway through the door Garrett is blocking. But what kind of angle do you think that would be? How good of a glimpse can you get looking into a room with Garrett blocking the doorway? Are you going to like lean up over Garrett and like really give get a good peek? The door was in the corner with the bed to the left, from what I understand. So you would see the legs closest to you and then the torso and then the head which would be the farthest thing away and laying flat on the bed, looking up to the ceiling. So at that angle, you're going to see the bottom of the chin, the bottom of the nose and whatever else you can make out of the face from that distance. So again, how long are you going to stand there gawking with Garrett engaging you in conversation, blocking the door, whatever? Like, do you think that would count as acceptable positive identification? Would it be much more likely that he saw a body and assumed it was Billy the kid because Garrett said so? Also, this guy doesn't really sound like someone that tries too hard in my opinion. My friend was killed and I had to get out of there because I ain't serving a no coroner's jury for my buddy. What? I mean, you don't want to go to the big funeral? Like, wasn't the body at Beaver Smith's all night? Wasn't the body across the street? Wasn't the body in another room in Maxwell's like the fake coroner's jury report says? No, Otero, who seems to me actually like the most independent witness, because I don't think he really cared, um, says Billy the Kid was laying out on Maxwell's bed with the blood all over his chest. Garrett tells him it's the kid and he's all right, cool, bye. So he hears the kid's killed. He comes over. He sees his body. And he's like, all right, see you guys. Then when they try to get him to meet Brushy Bill Roberts years later, he's like, nah, I'm good. So, I mean, again, this guy I don't think tries too hard. And I actually believe this guy because he strikes me as too lazy to make anything up. I mean, I literally think they told him it was a kid. And he's like, all right, cool. And he left. But this story that he tells makes a lot more sense than a lot of the other stories. But now let's get to the person that has to be the most credible witness. Used to be Delavina, but she said she's not there and didn't do it and all that. Then maybe Paco Anaya, but you can see he's all over the place and all of his information is bad and doesn't add up. So maybe Jesus Silva. I mean, if you're going to pick a guy, there's no better guy than Jesus. Jesus Silva was a resident of Fort Sumner and was a known associate of Billy the Kid. Over the years, he was interviewed multiple times, and he consistently said that Billy the Kid was dead. He saw the body. He built the casket, not Domingo Swabacker, and he personally buried Billy the Kid. It just doesn't get any more definite than that. Now, between us, I do find it interesting that critics will accept wholeheartedly, without question, newspaper interviews with Jesus Silva as the gospel, but reject notarized sworn statements made under penalty of perjury by Severo Gallegos as an outright fraud. But I I get it. If I'm going to pick a gospel, I too would choose the one with Jesus in it. So I guess they have that in their favor. But not only Jesus, Manuel Taylor, who knew the kid in Silver City, gave statements to the press that he saw Billy the Kid in Mexico in 1916 and Billy the Kid was alive. Why do they completely ignore those? No, no, no. You got Jesus Silva, man. He knew it. And then you got Paco and I, and you got that, Me- that, that Mexican Navajo woman. Okay. You can't pick and choose, folks. All right. So let's look at exactly what Jesus Silva said. And we have a lot to choose from because dude gave multiple interviews. So here's one from 1938 where he's interviewed by Jack Hall in the Clovis News Journal. And here's what he says. The title of the article is Only One Man Living Who Saw Billy the Kid in Both Life and Death. And now what's interesting is they have two guys, Jesus Silva, 86, the only living man who saw Billy the Kid in both life and death, and then Frank Lobato, 76, who confirmed Jesus Silva's story of how the kid died. His mother saw the kid in death. So wait a minute. In other accounts... Frank Lobato said at other times he was there. So what is going on with Frank Lobato? Why is he changing his story and saying, I was there. I was definitely there. I saw the kid. Other And then other people say, no, he was there. But then in this article, he says, no, I wasn't. My mom saw the kid, not me. Very interesting. But let's see what the article says by Jack Hull. And the article says, if I had any doubt in my mind as to whether or not Billy the Kid, the famous gunman of the early 80s, is dead, 
according to the best authorities, or yet living in a remote mountain region in Old Mexico, according to the reports which persist now and then. That doubt was dispelled last Saturday when I talked to the only living man who knew Billy the Kid personally who saw him in death. Jesus! Jesus! The occasion for seeking out this man was a recent trip to New Mexico of Major Gordon Lilly, Polly Bill, and a party of historians who came to the Sunshine State to ascertain if the kid was uh, really killed that fateful night. Now, sidebar, Gordon Lilly was in a car accident in 1938, I believe. Died, I think, in the early 40s. Uh, I think he would have gotten to the bottom of this, uh, actually, but whatever. Sidebar. Um, so anyway, the occasion for seeing out this man was a recent trip to New Mexico of Major Gordon Lilly, Pawnee Bill, and a party of historians who came to the Sunshine State to ascertain if the kid, so we went to Florida? Anyway, uh, to, to ascertain if the kid was really killed that fateful night in 1881 when he unexpectedly, the victim of a bullet from the 44 Winchester of Pat Garrett. Winchester, although it used to be, I believe, the Volcanic Arms Company and they did make pistols, Winchester made the famous lever action rifle and other manufacturers made the pistols. Uh, so what you'll see from Jesus is he does say very clearly and repeatedly that Garrett killed uh, the kid with a Winchester 4440 lever action rifle, not a pistol, which he's the only one that says that. And I think it's interesting. Anyway, uh, Winchester of Pat Garrett, the sheriff of Lincoln County, or whether there is ground to believe the rumors, the kid is yet alive. Nobody ever questioned Garrett. So here again in 1938, they're questioning Garrett as there's so many news. It's such a stupid thing to say. There's there's so many newspapers uh, that say that prove conclusively a lot of people question Garrett. Anyway, um, several years ago, I became interested in these rumors that the kid is yet alive. And I thought perhaps there might be some grounds for these rumors because they persisted. So I went to the only region where I knew I might obtain the truth, the region of Fort Sumner, where there lived at that time three people at least who knew the facts. One of these persons was Delavina Maxwell, Navajo Indian, slave woman, who was a household servant in the home of Don Pedro Maxwell. The night the, the, night the kid was killed, Delavina told me she saw Billy the Kid a few moments after Garrett fired at him in the darkness of Pete Maxwell's room. Why do cops separate witnesses? Why do cops ask you the same questions over and over to see if your story changes? Delavina personally wrote a letter that contradicts what she supposedly told this guy, Jack Hall. Very interesting. Saw him a few moments after Garrett fired at him in the darkness of Pete Maxwell's bedroom where the Don of the Pecos lay ill on his bed. A couple of people say that Don uh, Maxwell was actually sick that night. It's kind of interesting. Delavina also told me she dressed the kid for burial. Wait, Paco Anaya said he did that. Maybe she helped. I believe her story. But the reports and stories of his escape into Mexico persisted. And only last week, what are these people, stupid? Why would you keep saying the kid lived? Everybody knows he's dead. Nobody ever questioned Garrett. Uh, but then the reports and stories still persisted. And only last week, a woman in Silver City, New Mexico, told of talking to an old prospector from Mexico who told her he knew Billy the Kid personally. This is Manuel Taylor who did know Billy the Kid personally, and is crazy, credible. Manuel Taylor was rich. He owned a bunch of mines. He was very prominent. And that he had met the kid, now an old man, in a small mountain town in Mexico in 1914. He and the kid, he said, talked over old times with a drink of friendly bottle. This old prospector, she said, was Manuel Taylor, known throughout that region as a reliable source of everyday information. Nah. La, 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 la. Then came Pawnee Bill with his party to get to the bottom. What Pawnee Bill ascertained and what he will report is unknown, but I do know to my own satisfaction that all rumors notwithstanding, Billy Kidd was dead. So let's skip down. The only living man knew him personally, blah, blah, blah. Jesus Silva, blah, blah, blah. And he says, that may be the rumor, my boy, but if there are dead men in this world, then Billy the Kid is among them. I know he is dead, and as far as I know, I am the only one yet living who saw him in death. That's pretty clear. So Lobato didn't see him in death, for sure, even though he's standing right next to him and they took a picture with him. So I believe that statement implicitly, for I have found corroboration in the story of another man who is yet living, whose mother, now dead, told him that Silva knew more than any man alive of the facts, the real facts in connection with Billy Kidd's last day on earth. 
and his violent death that July night in 1881. After Jesus Silva told me that he knew the kid was killed that night, I asked him point blank, how? How do you know? And this is the story he told me. Quote, it was the night of July 14th, 1881. It had been a hot day throughout the valley of the Mesa Redondo country, and I had strolled over to a neighbor's house and on my return had stopped under a big cottonwood tree for a moment. When the kid, whom I had known for some time, strolled up, he had just ridden into town. He was hot and tired, and there we drank beer together. He told me he was hungry and he was going to go to the home of Don Pedro Maxwell for a cut of fresh beef for his supper, which was being prepared at a nearby house. We parted there, and in a few minutes, there were shots. The news soon spread that Garrett had shot the kid at Maxwell's home. I ran over there, and Garrett, who had run out of the house, told me to go in and see if the kid was dead. He stated that he had shot Billy in Maxwell's bedroom. So wait a minute. It wasn't Delavina Maxwell, the first in. And it wasn't Pete Maxwell, who Delavina Maxwell said was first in. Jesus Silva says he was first in. Okay. I walked into the unlighted room, stepped around a body lying on the floor, and lit a coal oil lamp sitting on the mantel. I turned around and walked over to the body of Billy. It was lying face down on the floor, a large knife in one hand and a pistol, a large knife hmm, in one hand and a pistol in the other. I felt of him, and he was dead. I wonder if he checked for keistered knives. All right, I'm just kidding. I then stepped outside the house and told Garrett that Billy was dead. A few moments later, I returned to the room, picked up the lifeless body of Billy, and walked it into a large hallway in the Maxwell home, laid his body on a long table. I there examined him again and ascertained without doubt, homie is dead. The body was then removed to an old carpenter shop nearby where Billy was laid out. Now, this, this does make sense because where are you going to put him in the coffin? You're going to, the coffin is in the carpenter shop. So you can either try to get the coffin inside Maxwell's house and do it there, or just take the kid next door and put him in the coffin. That makes sense. Of course, there, an inquest had to be held. There was no justice of the peace at Old Fort. So we just smashed a messenger for Alejandro Segura, just as the peace at a little town 10 miles up the river. Segura came and the inquest was held. Now, he says the inquest was held after the body was removed. A lot of other things say, you know, the body wasn't moved until um, after the inquest. So, again, this nothing jives here. But this is, you know, still a very credible account. I mean, so far. Um, an inquest had to be held. There was no just peace, blah, blah. Next morning at 10 o'clock, we buried Billy the Kid in the little cemetery near the old fort beside the bodies of his buddies. I was the chief pallbearer. That morning, with me were Antonio Saavedra, Saval Gutierrez, Vicente Otero, and a few others. We buried the kid in a grave which had been dug by Vicente Otero. Again, Burns, in his book, says that Francisco Medina dug the grave. I think we just said that Paco Anaya said that Dom Domingo Serbacher dug the grave. So who dug the grave? But anyway... According to Silva, Vicente Otero dug the grave. The latter died in Fort Sumner in February 35 at the age of 96. The bullet from Garrett's 44 Winchester, which he fired from a hip position. Now, Poe said Garrett put his rifle by the door. But Silva says Garrett's got it on the bed and he's got it at a hip position. And he shoots the kid in the chest with a 44 Winchester. Struck Billy in the right side of his chest. Other article, he'll say it was about two feet away. Strange as it may seem, that wound did not bleed for two hours after he was shot. There was just a little red spot on his light colored shirt where the bullet had hit him. Billy was shot at about 930 o'clock on the night of July 14th. So Anaya says eight o'clock. Uh, Silva says 930. Garrett says midnight. Everybody, a lot of the people said midnight. But the wound didn't bleed. You ever shot a 4440? I happen to collect these guns and I have shot these guns. That's a big round, man. And even if you miss a rib and you go clean through, I guess it's possible it wouldn't bleed for two hours. But that's certainly not what I would expect. I would expect a freaking size of a grapefruit hole in the back of Billy the Kid is what I would expect because the exit wound would be horrific. But no blood. Got it. Um, 
that was Jesus Silva's story of the incidents on the night the kid was killed. And that story was corroborated by Frank Lobato, 76, who Saturday told me the Silva story of the death of the kid and the incidents of that night and the following day were just as his mother, Marie Lobato, had recounted them to him when he returned to Fort Sumner a short time after Billy was killed. Lobato said he was working on the old Pigpen Ranch southwest of Melrose at the time Billy was killed. And Lobato also knew the kid personally. He said that Billy, only a short time before his death, had spent a month hiding out at the Pigpen Ranch headquarters, which were then the property of Don Pedro Maxwell. Lobato said that... Uh, Lobato told me his mother saw the body of Billy the Kid in the morning. It was laid to rest in a little cemetery down the valley. To me, Silva's story of the death of the kid is the true story of this mooted case. As far as I can ascertain, I only believe we've, and I believe I have found the only real source of authentic information. The story that the man killed by Garrett was a young cattle inspector who made himself objectionable in the region is false. Wait, I thought no one ever questioned Garrett. Where's this story coming on? There was always uh, stories of Garrett killing the wrong guy, and he killed a young cattle inspector. He killed a uh, sheep herder. There's a lot of different stories. Uh, Garrett came to Fort Sumner to get Billy, and he got him, Silva declared, with a finality that dismissed all reports to the contrary. Whatever we may now think of Billy the Kid, his reputation uh, as a killer and a bad man, and what some cattlemen and peace officers of that day thought of him and his alleged slaying of a man for each of the 21 years of his life, the natives of that day find him to be a patriot and true friend. And it goes on to say that uh, Fort Summer is basically asleep to the story, meaning they, they don't really care about this anymore, um, which is interesting because there are many articles where the grave was lost and found, lost and found, lost and found. And none other than Charlie Seringo said that by 1920, all of the other graves in that cemetery had been moved. And there's only two graves left there. And it was the kid and Tom O'Fallier. But all traces had been obliterated, and it was an alfalfa field. So in 1920, uh, Serengo says there's no way of figuring out where the grave was anymore. But then magically they find it uh, multiple times. And Jesus Silva many times is the guy that takes him and says, yeah, it's right here. All right. All right. So that's the first article with Jesus Silva. And I've already kind of pointed out, so sorry to repeat myself, but why aren't we giving equal consideration to Manuel Taylor and Severo Gallegos? Manuel Taylor repeatedly told people the kid was alive and he definitely knew the kid and was a prominent businessman owning lots of different silver mines throughout the region and being known as a source of reliable information. Why are we why would someone believe Paco Anaya and Delavina Maxwell over Manuel Taylor? Shouldn't he at least be given equal weight? Also, another old timer, Severo Gallegos who helped the kid escape from the Lincoln County Jail, signed a sworn statement under penalty of perjury in front of the notary public that he saw Billy the Kid alive in 1950, and he said that Brushy Bill Roberts was Billy the Kid. But these two people are completely disregarded in favor of two people that didn't testify under penalty of perjury and whose statements we have already shown contradict in our suspect. In the case of Delavina Maxwell, she tells this guy she was there immediately after, but we have an actual letter by her that says otherwise. But there's more. And this is the last one I'm going to share for Jesus Silva. But the Rio Doso News in 1936 published another interview with Jesus Silva. And in that interview, he says, I was with Billy the Kid the night just before Pat Garrett killed him. This one's by Vance Johnson. He says, Jesus Silva, 85, lives in a squatty whitewashed adobe house in Fort Sumner with his sons, blah, blah, blah. I was with Billy the Kid the night before Pat Garrett killed him. They were talking of inconsequentialities, but then there had been a time when Jesus had warned the kid to stay away from Sumner. I asked Billy why he kept coming back to Fort Sumner, Silva said. I said, don't you know you're going to get killed? And Billy said, yes, I know I'm going to get killed, and I know who's going to do it, Pat Garrett. But Billy Wilson and me swore we were going to stay here till we killed Barney Mason, and I'm staying. Mason was once a friend of the kids who later became an enemy of his and an ally of Garrett's. The kid had been in Fort Sumner several days before Garrett tracked him down, actually two months. Also, there was Butcher, who rode into town with a fine horse. No idea who Butcher is. Some people have opined this could be Billy Barlow. Don't know. I don't think so. So Billy the Kid steals this horse from this guy, Butcher. And then he goes on to say, most houses in Fort Sumner are one story and one room wide, but several rooms long. Doors from each room lead to the front yard. It was in an empty room in a friend's house to which Billy the Kid took his stolen horse. Jesus was sitting on his doorstep one night. It was July 14th, 1881. 
enjoying an after-dinner cigarette when the kid came by and stopped. Beely, Beely, came the almost breathless shout as an old man rounded the corner of Silva's adobe. There's somebody in the house with your horse. I'm afraid to go. Old man Saval Gutierrez, whose first name Jesus can't remember, had been sent by the kid to water his horse. Oh, you're just a coward, the outlaw barked at Saval and turned and asked Silva if he would help him water the horse. We took his horse out to water, then took him back to the house, and there was nobody around, Silva says. So wait, there's no big party? Like Paco and Aya said? Then the kid and Silva sat down on the edge of an irrigation canal to resume their conversation. The outlaw suggested beer, and Silva went to get it. When I got back, Billy and me sat there and drank and talked for several minutes, Silva said. While we sat there, Pat Garrett and the other sheriffs were hiding behind the trees with their guns pointed at us. The other sheriffs wanted to kill Billy, but Pat wouldn't let them because I was there. So wait a second. Garrett mentioned seeing people in the orchard and says, if I'd have known as a kid, I shot him. But Silva says Garrett had to talk the other deputies out of shooting them. They were ready to go. They were like, let's take those guys out. And Garrett says no, because he recognized Jesus Silva. Very interesting. And just wait till you hear what I'm going to share with you in a second about the deputies seeing Billy the Kid before he was supposedly killed and knowing it was Billy the Kid before he was supposedly killed. Silva pushed his peak sombrero over one eye and yawned a little. I'd have got killed that night if it wasn't for Pat, he said dreamily. But Pat knew men, and we used to work together for Maxwell at the old bull camp. The kid turned suddenly and said, do you have any fresh beef? Now, wait a minute. He had just said he's going to go to Maxwell's, right, earlier. But now he looks at Silva and says, do you have self, uh, fresh beef? And Silva says, no, but I killed a calf for Pete Maxwell today. The outlaw jumped to his feet. I'll just go over and make old Pete give me some of that, he said, and strolled off in the direction of Maxwell's rambling old house, which once had been the officer's quarters in the old fort. So wait, Silva says that he killed the beef. Other accounts say Maxwell had killed a beef. But I guess if Maxwell was ill, did he kill a beef? Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Now, this is a continuing quote in the article. Quote, Walter Noble Burns in his book, The Saga of Billy the Kid, says that Celsa Gutierrez, the daughter of Savel Gutierrez, told the outlaw about the freshly killed calf at Maxwell's house. He says the kid took a butcher knife from the Gutierrez home. It may be the old man Saval mentioned by Jesus Silva with Salva uh, Gutierrez. Jesus was unable to understand where the kid got the butcher knife he clutched in his hand when he was killed. It may be that the outlaw stopped by the Gutierrez home and borrowed the knife after he left Silva. At any rate, he moved slowly because Pat Garrett beat him to Maxwell's. So Silva says, quote, Pat ran all the way and was sitting on Pete's bed when Billy came, Silva said. It has been said that in entering Maxwell's house, the kid almost ran over John W. Poe of Roswell, who was sitting on the porch steps. But Silva says nobody was on the porch. So hold on a second. This is different than what Silva said before. He's saying that Gary and the deputies saw them and recognized them in the orchard. We're going to shoot, but Pat says, no, I don't want you to shoot Jesus. So then he sees Billy get up and head towards Maxwell. So he runs and hides in the bedroom before Billy comes. This is the star witness. This is the most credible guy in the world. And then Silva says, there was nobody on the porch. The most credible guy says all the stuff that Poe said, he and S, who are you? You know, uh, Garrett says that uh, McKinney stands up and catches his spurs and the kid laughs at him and there's a whole thing on the porch. There was nobody on the porch. That's what Jesus Silva says. Okay, the article continues. Entering the Maxwell house, the outlaw passed through several rooms before he reached the one in which Pete Maxwell lay ill. That's different. Billy stepped in the room and said, Pete, and Pat Garrett shot him, Silva said. Pat knew Billy's voice, and he wasn't more than this far. He measured his hands two feet apart from him. When he shot, he used a 44 Winchester rifle. Star witness. The kid fell to the floor as a second shot was heard, and Garrett and Maxwell ran out of the room. Silva said that Maxwell sent a servant for him. The man shouted, hey, Seuss, come here. I think Pat has killed Billy. I ran over and I went into the house, Silva said. When I got to the room, I said to Billy, I know what to hurt you, Billy. It's Jesus. I'm coming in. And that dialect is, is uh, written in the original. 
But the outlaw was dead. He lay face down and the borrowed butcher knife in one hand, his out, his revolver in the other. He must have drawn the gun even after Garrett had fired. There was one bullet through him and another stuck in the wall, Silva said. I don't know where that one came from, but I think maybe it was from Billy's gun. It was pointed that way. Silva said there wasn't even one Mexican cent in the outlaw's pockets. When the officer searched him, Pat Garrett took his gun. The kid died at 9 o'clock. Silva said he helped move the body to an old carpenter shop near the Maxwell house, but then he went home at Pete Maxwell's bidding. So wait a minute, he moved into the carpenter shop, but I thought he built the coffin. There's other things that say that Pete, that Jose Silva built the coffin, but he says Pete Maxwell said, go home. So he helped carry him, but then he's tired. I've been working all day and Pete thought that I ought to get some sleep. So who's calling the shots? Pete Maxwell. Hey, Seuss, grab that dead body and move it to the carpenter shop and go get some sleep. He says that Vicente Otero, Juan Medina, Juan Pacheco, and old man Saval sat up with the body that night. The next morning, Silva himself rode 10 miles to get the justice of the peace who conducted the inquest. So nobody went for uh, Alejandro Segura until the next morning. The kid was buried at 9 or 10 o'clock in the old Fort Sumner graveyard. His remains are still there. Now, sunrise was 4.55 a.m. Uh, on that day. And he says they were buried about 9 or 10 o'clock and that Alejandro Segura was uh, 10 miles away. I don't know. You can do the math. Could you go get him, have a coroner's report, build a coffin, and do all that stuff in four hours or three hours? The kid was buried at 9 or 10 o'clock in the old Fort Sumner graveyard. His remains are still there. No big funeral, no any of that. After the burial, Pat Garrett went to Santa Fe to claim the reward by the governor. Uh, I think it was $1,000, but I don't remember. That's all Garrett wanted the kid for, the money. They were once friends. So anyway, um, he goes on, but doesn't really say any more. So that's pretty much all he says about the death of Billy the Kid. So let me get this straight. Silva now says... The kid had just rode into town. There's no big party with everybody's family, Paco and Naya, whatever. Now, remember, Silva knows more than anybody else. So if Silva says it, it's true. No big party. It's just him and Billy the Kid, mano y mano. They have a beer. Now, I could see this happening, actually. And I could also see Vicent. I could see him doing it maybe in uh, Beaver Smith Saloon or the Hargrove Saloon somewhere. And I could also see Vicente Otero being in the same bar not really with them, but near them and saying hello. Because you got to kind of figure out, okay, where does this connect? Where do you see echoes of the people saying the same thing? And, in, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that some of these people gave statements clearly saying, no, that's not right, that's wrong, I wasn't there, then you would hear the echoes of Delavina Maxwell being there uh, first. And you'd say, yes, yeah, she was probably first. But when she comes straight out and says, no, it wasn't true, then you don't believe it, right? So there's a process you follow and you kind of have to just make up your own mind, okay? So that's going to be different from everybody. But one thing I know is this is totally jacked up. So it's Silva and the kid, mano a mano. So anyway, Billy tells Silva he's going to go to Pete Maxwell's for some beef and he goes. Silva hears the shots, runs to Maxwell's and Garrett himself runs out of the house and says, hey, you go in there and see if he's dead. So Silva goes into the dark room, steps over the body, lights the coal lamp. He turns around, walks over to the body, which is face down. He rolls it over. Oh my God, it's Billy. He has a knife in one hand, a gun in the other. He feels him and says, he's dead, Jim. So he goes and tells Garrett and then goes back in. And according to his other statement, Picks the body up by himself, carries it down the hallway, and puts it on a table. There, he does another examination and says, yep, he's dead. Body's then removed to the carpenter shop nearby where Billy's laid out. But wait, Otero says the next morning, the body was on Maxwell's bed. The coroner's jury says it was in another room in the same house. Once again, the timing may be off, but I could believe that Jesus Silva moved the body from Pete's bed after Otero left and put it on the table so it would be ready for examination when the coroner's jury got there. That kind of makes sense to me. I think the body stayed in Maxwell's room all night. I think they picked it up and put it on the bed, and then uh, they didn't let anybody look at it. They barricaded themselves in, as Post said. Garrett guarded the door. So when Otero comes the next morning, he sees it on the bed. He sees Garrett. And he's like, all right, I'm out of here. He leaves. Then Jose Silva shows back up because he had been sent home by Maxwell the night before. And uh, they say, hey, why don't you move this to a table Because and then go get Segura and we'll do a coroner's jury. So meanwhile, Garrett had started writing up what he wanted him to say. 
and uh, the rest is is history. But we'll keep going here. So that's what I believe. But according to Garrett and Poe and some other people, he was killed at midnight. According to Anaya, 8 p.m. And according to Silva, 9 p.m. And now, supposedly, Garrett gave $25 to buy clothes for the kid, and they took the body, and they prepared it for burial, and they had this big wake. So when and where exactly did they buy the clothes that they put on the body? Did Fort Sumner have a 24-hour Walmart that I don't know about where they could just go get, you know, those socks kind of look nice uh, for the kid? No, they had one little store that didn't sell much. So did they go get that guy out of bed? And say we need to do some shopping. Okay, fine. Or they just go in and take it. Fine. Let's say that happened. So they buy the clothes. They dress the body. They have a big wake for the dead. They take them over to Beaver Smith's saloon. And they stay up all night with the body. But wait, the coroner's jury didn't come until the next morning. Are you telling me Paco and I and Delavina and all the friends prepared the body and put new clothes on it before it was examined? Then how would they examine it and say it was a justified shooting if you've already... Totally dressed the body and everything. I don't think it happened. I don't think there was a wake at all. I don't think it was any service for this guy. Based on what these people are saying. These are their statements. I wasn't there. I'm just going by what I'm reading. This whole thing makes no sense. But again, you can do what I did. And you can use the old computer. And you can come back and say, hey, sunrise in Fort Sumner, as I mentioned, was 4.55 a.m. So Miguel Otero gets there, sees the body, leaves. Hey, so Silva gets there, picks the body up, puts it on the table, and then goes and gets Segura and comes back. And then the coroner's jury shows up, sees the body, does the inquest. And then they take it, get it ready for burial, do the wake. Everybody sees it and then have this huge funeral that hundreds of people come to all by 9 or 10 o'clock. Well, that, that's just not possible. There's not enough time for those things to happen. So somebody's got to be wrong or lying. You could say, you know, the Paco Anaya says they were there that night. So magically, you know, Alejandro Segura is there and he says, you're a constable and all you guys are jurors and they handle it. Bang, done. That would make sense if they had the coroner's inquest right after Garrett killed him. But why, why does nobody agree on what happened? Oh, it was so confusing. It wasn't that confusing. There's a lot of people like right there. You're standing right there. You have Poe, McKinney, Garrett, Maxwell, four people right there. This isn't that this isn't that hard. I get it when it's uh, a different scenario, but this is pretty clear cut. And yet they can't get the story straight. So what do we do with our star witness, Jesus Silva? And I'm going to give you my opinion. We know that Garrett tried to turn Billy's friends. OK, my personal belief, if you remember the story of Charlie Bowdry, when he's shot, he walks towards Garrett and he says, I wish I wish. And then he falls dead. And people say, I wonder what he was going to say. You know, we'll never know what he was going to say. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is Garrett met with Bowdry secretly uh, prior to that event. I don't think it was very long before, a few days before that happened. I personally believe Garrett was trying to get him to sell the kid out and Bowdry wouldn't do it. And so I think when he got shot and he's stumbling towards Garrett and he says, I wish, I wish, I think he's going to say, I wish I'd have listened to you. I wish I would have whatever. Personally, there's no evidence for that other than the fact that they had a private meeting and Garrett was trying to get him to flip. And so based on, again, what I know, studying this for 20 years or so, I think that Silva flipped on the kid. I think that Silva was trying to, if he didn't, I think he did flip. I personally think that Jesus Silva was going to sell the kid out. He worked for Maxwell. Uh, Maxwell had flipped. And I personally am very suspicious about Jesus Silva. I think if he didn't flip, he was walking a fine line and trying to like not, you know, sell him out without being caught for selling him out or pretend like he's selling him out without actually selling him out. So something he was definitely in the middle. And how did he know that Garrett was in the orchard? He knew, but he didn't tell the kid or supposedly he found out later. I don't buy it. I, I personally think Jesus knew. I think he was setting him up and, uh, you know, he knew Garrett was in town. And he says, you know, oh, yeah, I just killed a beef, man. Go get that beef. That's some good beef over there I just killed today. So, yeah, I totally think. But there's something that stands out to me in Jesus's other interview. And that's that Garrett knew it was the kid in the orchard. And so did his deputies. And he had to stop them from ventilating both Silva and the kid. Right? That's not what Garrett said. Garrett said they heard voices but didn't realize it was a kid till later. 
but Silva says no, they were gonna kill me, but fortunately Pat didn't do it. Did he find that out afterwards? It seems suspicious. And lastly, Silva suggests that he's the one that said Billy should go to Maxwell's. Gotta be honest, as I read it, it sounds to me like Jesus Silva was in cahoots with Garrett and trying to lure the kid into a trap, or at minimum trying to play both sides. And I think that's what's going on. But there's one more person we haven't heard from yet. And that person is William H. Brushy Bill Roberts, who claimed to be Billy the Kid, and who Severo Gallegos said was Billy the Kid. And I know this is going to be painful if you are one of the people that want to dismiss Roberts's claims. But hey, he did claim to be Billy the Kid. So why don't we at least hear what he has to say, right? After all, critics are going to tell you that he was only two years old when Billy the Kid was killed, which is so stupid. If I use your ID to buy beer, it doesn't change my birthday. The, the idea that because the census shows Oliver Roberts is two years old in 1881, and that proves that Oliver Roberts wasn't Billy the Kid. Yeah, it does prove that. It doesn't prove anything about the guy who used his ID to buy beer, though. You, people have to get that, right? Like, that's not that hard of a concept. So I take it as dishonesty when people, you know, use that line um, because they got to know better. But what they're saying is uh, they, they don't believe him when he says he stole the identity. Then just say that. Say he lied about stealing an identity. Because Brushy Bill mentions two people specifically that he was with the night that Pat Garrett killed Billy Barlow and not him. And do you know who those two people were? Jesus Silva and Frank Lobato. And guess what two people, primary characters in this whole story where you're throwing around names and all these people were there. There's two people missing from Burns's book, Frank Lobato and Jesus Silva. So I wait, I thought that's where Brushy got all of his information. So how would he choose if he didn't know anything, if he was coached and read the saga of Billy the Kid by Walter Noble Burns, then where did those names come from? They're not in Burns' book at all. Zero. No mention of them at all. And yet those are the two people that Brushy mentions. So here's what Brushy has to say. He says, quote, I knew Celsa and Pat's wife, who were sisters to Saval Gutierrez, before Pat came to the country. Celsa was one of my sweethearts when I was in Fort Sumner. Her brother, Saval, lived in Fort Sumner. After I returned from hunting old John, Chisholm, he went up to the Canaditas and got Celsa for me. She wanted to go to Mexico with me, but I did not want to get married until Garrett was gone. While I was in Fort Sumner, I stayed at Gutierrez's, G Jesus Silva's, and Charlie Baldry's. I also stayed at the Yerby Ranch north of Fort Sumner quite a bit. We were good friends. I kept horses and mules there when Charlie Baldry worked for Yerby. He had a good-looking daughter who was sort of a sweetheart of mine. I don't remember her name. Fort Sumner had some good-looking girls in those days. Most of my time was spent at the Yerby Ranch after I broke jail in Lincoln. There were several cow and sheep camps on the road from Yerby's to Fort Sumner. How would he know this? He just got out a bunch of maps and atlases. I stopped off in most of them during the daytime. I rode into Fort Sumner from Yerby's a few days before Garrett and his posse rode in. When they rode in that day, I had spent the day with Garrett's brother-in-law, Sabal Gutierrez who's on the coroner's jury, by the way. Nearly all the people in this country were my friends and they helped me. None of them liked Garrett. Garrett and his posse came in that night while we were at a dance. Silva saw Garrett in Fort Sumner a little while before we rode in from the dance. He knew I was staying with Gutierrez, so he went over there to warn me to leave town. Gutierrez told him we were out at the dance. When my partner, me, and the girls rode into town, we stopped at Jesus Silva's. Jesus told Celsa that Garrett was in town looking for the kid. Why didn't he tell Billy? Why did he tell Celsa? I find that odd. About midnight, so Brushy Bill Roberts agrees with Pat Garrett and John Poe. About midnight, the girls left and I began asking him about Garrett. He got excited and told us to leave before Garrett found us there. I thought Garrett would go to Gutierrez's house and I had better stay away that night. I told Silva we were not going to leave until we had something to eat. He agreed to fix a meal for us. Okay, so Silva knows that Garrett's in town, tells Celsa, who tells the kid, and the kid's like, then I'm not moving. I'm not moving. I'm not going to go to Celsa's because that's where he's going to expect me to go. I'm not moving. So he's cooking the meal for us when my buddy asked for fresh beef. 
Now his buddy was drunk. His th- there's he says he was a heavy drinker in other accounts, so he wasn't using much common sense. So he asked for beef, and Silva says if one of us wants to go to Maxwell's and gets the beef, he's going to cook it for us. I sense to trap. Well, yeah, dude just said Garrett's in town, and now he's like, well, I killed a beef over there, man. If you want to go get it, so uh, Billy says no way, Jose, or in this case, no way, Jesus. But my partner insisted that we go get the beef. He started out to Maxwell's after I refused to leave Silva's house. I thought that Garrett might still be in town, and I wanted to meet him in the daylight so I could beat him to it. In a short time, we heard pistol shots. Interesting, not rifle shots. He heard pistol shots. I ran through the gate into Maxwell's backyard in the bright moonlight and started shooting at the shadows along the house. Not on the porch. Shadows along the house. Just like Silva said. One of the first shots had killed my partner on the back porch. After entering the yard, so there wasn't anybody in the back porch, but then his partner walked up there and gets killed on the back porch. After entering the yard, their first shot struck me in the lower left jaw, taking out a tooth. Uh, as I started over the back fence, another shot struck me in the back of my left shoulder. I emptied one of my 44s when another shot struck me across the top of my head, about an inch and a half back of the forehead and about two inches in length. That shot knocked me out uh, and I stumbled into the gallery of a, a pretty much knocked me senseless, right? And I stumbled into the gallery of an adobe behind Maxwell's yard fence. Um, And then he says a Mexican woman was living there and she pulled me in through the door. When I woke up, she was putting beef tallow on my head to stop the flow of blood. I told her to reload my 44s, which she did. I started to go back out after them when Celsa came running in and said that they had killed Billy Barlow and were passing off his body as mine. She begged me to leave town. She said they would not leave Maxwell's house for the night. They were afraid of being mobbed, as they should have been. About three o'clock in the morning, Celsa brought my horse up to the adobe. I pushed my 44s into the scabbards and rode out of the town with Frank Lobato. We stayed at the sheep camp the next day. Then I moved to another camp south of Fort Sumner, where I stayed until my wounds healed enough to travel. Now, what sheep camp was south of Fort Sumner? Paco and Naya's father's camp was south of Fort Sumner. So Brushy Bill says that he rides out of town at 3 a.m. with Frank Lobato and stays at Paco Anaya's place until he gets well enough. Then he goes to Mexico and he gets the hell out of there. Now, a lot of people that hear Brushy Bill's version and understand that he would have no way of knowing who the people he talks about were. He would have no way of knowing it was a moonlit night. He would have no way of knowing about all the area around Fort Sumner, the sheep camps, or any of that stuff if he was really Oliver Roberts born in 1879. And you know, he didn't go by Ollie. Ollie went by Ollie. But when Brushy Bill becomes Ollie, he goes by Billy. What's up with that? Or Brushy Bill. What's up with that? He stole his identity. Also, There's disparities in the historical record after about 1910. He starts listing that his parents were born in different states than before. There's a lot of evidence that Brushy Bill Roberts was not Oliver Roberts. But people aren't going to stop lying to you about it. So, although Brushy Bill would have no way of knowing any of these things if he was Oliver Roberts, he would certainly know all these things if he was Billy the Kid. But the one thing that people have struggled with is the shootout with Garrett's posse. People will say that no one ever mentioned hearing all those gunshots. Well, that's true. But we just got through talking about a lot of people that didn't hear the shots that Garrett fired either. What's that about? Delavina Maxwell lives in the house. She didn't hear the shots. But in my opinion, given all the problems with all the statements, I actually think that Brushy Bill Roberts' version makes the most sense and is the one most supported by the evidence. But I have one more twist for you. Remember the old drunk? George Graham and White Oaks, the one that Burns said had wasted his life and was now in a, quote, down at the heels derelict, making shift to exist as a hanger on around White Oaks saloons and gambling halls. Do you know who that guy was? Well, Burns didn't know who he was, but I do. And I don't think very many people have figured this out. But George Graham was a famous outlaw. And the name under which he was most known is Shotgun John Collins. And I want to tell you about Shotgun John Collins. And so for this purpose, I'm just going to go to Wikipedia. And Wikipedia says there's a lot of source citations required, but it has a pretty good overview of Abraham G. Graham. 
born November 22nd, 1851, died December 2nd, 1922. Known by the alias Shotgun John Collins, was a little-known, though well-associated, gunfighter and outlaw of the American Old West. Abraham Graham was born on his grandmother's plantation, blah, blah, blah. His great-grandfather, Captain Edward O'Connor, served in the South Carolina militia during the American Revolution under Brigadier General Francis Marion. His father, Hosea Graham, had married his first cousin, Martha Graham. And while Abraham was still a child, the family moved to Texas and covered wagons in 1859. While living in Limestone County, Texas, Abe Graham, uh, also known as John Collins, and John Wesley Hardin were partners, both coming from staunchly pro-Confederate families. Hardin writes in his biography that John Collins was once married to one of his cousins and comments that while he was in an Austin jail, Hardin met some noted men, and he names John Collins as one of the noted men. He also mentions Pipes and Herndon of the Bass Gang, Johnny Ringo, Manning's Clements, and Brown Bowen. Collins was sought by lawmen for crimes, including cattle rustling, and fled to Texas for Mexico. After that time, Collins moved to Uvalde, Texas, and became one of the five so-called Uvalde Minutemen, alongside Captain J.J.H. Patterson, Henry Patterson, W.B. Nichols, and Tom Leakey. These five fearless Minutemen did what the Texas Rangers could not do. Collins then migrated into the western part of what was then Old Socorro County, New Mexico. As reported by the Grant County Herald, John's collar ushered in the year of 1875 with a bang, apparently deciding to kill a man named James Jim Smith. Collins was arrested by Sheriff Whitehill of Silver City, the same Sheriff Whitehill that had arrested Billy the Kid the first time, and he was jailed. He later bailed himself out for 60 bucks and migrated to Lincoln County, New Mexico. Many small cattlemen ran together during that time. Collins was in and around the area for about five years at the end of the bloody Lincoln County War. There he became associated with William H. Bonney, known as the notorious outlaw Billy the Kid. In Silver City, the kid was wanted at the time and moving around often. And for a time, Collins accompanied him. Collins fought in and all during the Lincoln County War. Holy freak. I mean, he's an old bum. This guy's a nobody that's sleeping in the hay. It's freaking Shotgun Johns Collin, alias John Graham, alias George Graham. This guy's a major player in the Southwest. But wait, there's more. When the war was over, both sides were still up in arms. The people who fought in the war were being persecuted and backwashed. Collins moved to the western part of Old Socorro County. Collins Park in the Elk Mountains of today's Gila National Park was named in tribute to Shotgun Collins. In April 1879, John Collins was in Reinerson's Territory Court in Lincoln, New Mexico, for rustling cattle and stealing horses. Collins' brother-in-law, Deputy Sheriff John Jack Long, was married to Collins' sister, Delilah Jane Graham. Long and Delilah had three children, Beulah, blah, 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 the latter of whom was named after John Riley, a partner in the Lincoln County War. Collins later went to Uvalde and married his fourth wife, et cetera, et cetera, under the name John Collins, on and on. John Collins met Wyatt Earp then working for Wells Fargo, and also Pat Garrett. Collins had changed his name from Graham to his great-grandfather's last name when he left Texas, going by John Collins to avoid trouble with the law on the earlier cattle rustling issue, but sometimes went by John Graham. Collins also worked for a time riding shotgun for Wells Fargo, and during this time, his bond with Wyatt Earp became strong. It was during this period that he became known by the nickname Shotgun due to the numerous shootings he was involved with associated with his work. He later worked as a buffalo hunter and a U.S. cavalry scout during the Army struggle with Geronimo and the Apache. Collins was closely associated with the famous W.S. Ranch. Eventually, he came to own four ranches in Socorro County. In 1903, Collins moved his family to Mexico and changed his name back to Graham. He worked for Green, Gold, and Silver in Mexico as a guard and owned several ranches there until the Mexican Revolution. In 1910, Collins escorted his family back to Hermosa. At that time, he sent his two little girls by train to live with his younger brother in Buffalo so they could be safe with family and get an education. Collins drifted for a time through El Paso, Texas, and later to Dodge City, Kansas. At times, he took part in outlaw activities, while others, he served as a member of posses. In 1883, he came to Dodge City with Wyatt Earp to support Luke Short during what became known as the Dodge City War. 
when the famous photographs depicting Wyatt Earp, Luke Short, Bat Masterson, Charlie Bassett, M.F. McLean, Neil Brown, William H. Harris, and W.F. Patillion were taken, as well as a less circulated copy of that excludes Patillion and includes Bill Tillman, Collins was present, as well as Johnny Millsap. Texas Jack Vermillion and others considered part of the Dodge City Peace Commission. However, they reportedly decided not to be in the picture. Collins was with Uncle John at the Wigwam Saloon in El Paso when John Selman was shot by George Scarborough and later testified in the Selman murder trial. He was never involved in any well-known gunfights, with most of his notoriety coming from his days riding shotgun for Wells Fargo and his associated with the other members of the Dodge City Peace Commission. He died in a gunfight at age 71 in El Paso during a dispute. His death certificate says otherwise. All right. Now, this dude was obviously a player. And people make fun of Brushy Bill Roberts because he said he was a deputy marshal for a time, went into the army for one year, and broke horses for a living. Oh, <laughs> Brushy could never do all that. <laughs> he couldn't know all them people. <laughs> I mean, seriously, John Collins was partners with Billy the Kid partners with John Wesley Harden, was a member of the Dodge City Peace Commission, friendly with Bat Masterson and Wyatt Earp. Come on. And 99% of people have never heard from him. But Walter Noble Burns says, this stupid old drunk, you know, in White Oaks, you know, he got a dollar out of Poe and said the kid's in Fort Sumner. All right, let's get back to what I said earlier. What if when John Collins, now understanding he's not some stupid old drunk, He's Shotgun Collins, and he's a bad dude. What if when John Collins says to Poe, and remember, Poe recognized him. He wasn't some old drunk. He's a gunfighter, and Poe knew dang well who he was, Shotgun Collins. So Poe goes to Garrett and says, hey, this guy says Shotgun Collins, who Garrett knew, says the kid's in Fort Sumner. Well, what did Garrett say to Manuel Brazil? Okay, you say he's in Fort Sumner, you come with us. I'll meet you. You come with us. So what if when Garrett hears that Shotgun Collins says that the kid's in Fort Sumner, what if Garrett were to say, okay, John, you come with us. You say he's in Fort Sumner, come with us. Now, there's no place in history that says that Garrett was there with John W. Poe, Kip McKinney, and Shotgun Collins, but he was an outlaw. Would you say he was there? So is it possible that Shotgun Collins was with Pat Garrett and John Poe and those guys that night? It's interesting. Is it possible? I mean, of course it's possible, but it's not mentioned. But why does it need to be mentioned? There's no mention of Manuel Brazil, except for by one guy, Charlie Seringo. And if Charlie hadn't mentioned it, nobody would know it. So obviously there's more to this story. I wouldn't bring it up. And what I'm about to share with you is an audio recording of the son of Shotgun Collins. And I want you to hear what he says about his dad. Ladies and gentlemen, the son of Shotgun John Collins. You said your father knew Billy the Kid. He knew Billy the Kid, and another thing my father said, he told me when I was a boy, grown, putting your grown, that Billy the Kid wasn't killed. Was not killed? Was not killed. Is that right? Yes, sir. What did he think happened to him then? He, 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 he told me, he said, he never said nothing about it, but way he got it that him and him and Pat Garrett one time was pretty close friends. They was good friends. That's right. They got together and Garrett told him, he said, you go to South America and don't you never show up. And he said, it'll be all over with. You were telling me uh, about uh, Billy the Kid and the fact you thought that he wasn't uh, uh, your father thought he was never killed. Now, what was it you were saying about that? Well, I was going to say that my father helped two other men pack him out to the, where they dug the grave. Or he helped two other men pack out who? Billy the Kid. Yeah. On a board. They packed him on some boards and two cross pieces, or one cross piece. They dug the grave, and then they, they come to the house and got him. It's dark. Yeah. And they packed him out, and, and he said he never saw his face or anything, but he could tell from the weight of him that it wasn't Billy the Kid. And this, this old sheep herder never did show up no more. And he stayed around, oh, 
I know as well as no other name you know too. You've heard it called the one that uh, had owned so much land and grants. Maxwell. Maxwell. Yeah. He stayed around Maxwell and he killed out in Maxwell how I supposed to. Yeah. Billy the kid. And he said this old man never did show up this old. He said he was a little bit of dried up Mexican, no old. Yeah. And he said that. He said he wasn't tall enough, long enough for Billy the Kid. <coughs> he said he wasn't, but I guess. Of course, I was grown then. And, he, and I said, well, Papa, I said, why well, didn't Dad, why didn't you say something about it? He said, God, the man wouldn't live to live 15 minutes. He had them. No, they're afraid to talk about it even now. Even now, they're afraid to talk about That's it, right. of course. My dad's been gone for several years, and I've told it several times just what he told me. Yeah. But then... And that's, and that's the words that he told me. Well, how well did your father know Billy the Kid? Well, he was with him, around him, and seen him time and time and again, and then nearly every day or two, and sometimes two or three days at a time, as long as Billy was, as long as that war was going on. And that was two or three years or something like that, a year or two. Two years, I think. Anyway. Well, didn't you say something about your father seeing Billy the Kid after he uh, made he that deal break in Lincoln? What he, about that? Tell me the details of that. Well, he said that uh, when he got in town, they told him, he said, Billy, he didn't talk to Billy long. Billy told him he got away. He said, I've done got away. When he got in town, why, they told him that uh, Bell and all of you both was killed. Billy had killed well, where him. did he meet Billy the Kid? How far away from Lincoln? No, about nine miles, he said, out of Lincoln. Well, was he riding horseback? Yeah, he was riding horseback. My dad was on horseback coming into Lincoln, and then Billy was going out. He said the horse was, you're riding a black horse, and his leather was sweat. But he was fat and hadn't done anything, and stood up and eating all the time. Dad, dad said he still had the chains on his feet, or on his le- ankles when he met him. Is that right? But they've been cutting two, they've been so, cutting he two so, he, so he could get on a horse. Cut them handcuffs. Mm-hmm. Two. He poured it on him, I guess, because Dad said when he met him, said that black horse was just falling in sweat. And he no. said, so I said, Billy, you're getting away, ain't you? He said, I've done got away. And now, it wasn't very long after that, though, that they finally uh, supposedly killed him. Supposedly killed him, just, just not too long after that. I have heard that Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid were in business together. Well, I never heard Dad say, but he told me at one time they was close friends. No. He said they was, and had talks together before, and the guard was supposed to take him. And they had, they had the talk, he told me, he said, I know that, that they had talks together. Of course, there wasn't many men know it, knew it, but they had. How far is Fort Sumner from Lincoln? <clears throat> well, I don't Very know far. just how far it is. I wouldn't, I don't know. I've never been in that country very much. Been through there several times, but I don't know. How How, how did it happen your father was there? Was to carry well, I never asked him how come he was there, but he was on some kind of business yeah. down there when he was killed. That is, like, uh, when this man, who was supposed to be Billy the Kid, was killed, mm. then uh, there were three men that carried him to the grave, was it? It was just <coughs> three men, <coughs> and I couldn't tell you the name of the yeah. other two. Now... And, uh, where did they bury him? Did your father ever say? Yes, he told me, but I, I don't know, and I, I've never been there, and I often thought no. that going through there, if ever I got close to Fort Sumner, I'd go on his gra- grave up if it was marked. Well, didn't, like to, uh, didn't he or the other man look at the, this body to see whether no. he was the kid? No, there was, uh, there was the deputies from not along with him. I guess they, they just sent after them. He was staying with one uh, all night with one of these fellas that they came after. So the the three of them packed him out. Would your father know where he was? uh, Did your father know where he was buried? Yes. Well, why wouldn't they dig up the body to prove it was Billy the Kid? Well, as he said, if it had been anything said about it in that day and time, why a man wouldn't have lasted very long, because he'd have been he'd have been killed. He told me that Billy the Kid was never killed by Pat Garrett, that they killed a sheep herder and buried him for Billy the Kid. And here you come along and tell me the same thing. Same thing. thing. My dad was right there. Well, I'll tell you, my dad was uh, running the stage stand, taking care of the stage stand between Socorro and Lincoln at that time in in the Oscudo Mountains. You know where they're at over there. I don't. 
don't know what they call them, scooters or uh, uh, squirrels or something no. like that. And he had the stage stand. Over he had the stage stand somewhere around Capitan. Well, I think it was right yeah. in around there that yeah. he had the he's taking care of this stage stand. Yes. For the for the government. Right. And, that, and now that that's what I know he did that because he told me all about it, and that's the time that he got pretty familiar with Billy the Kid. Did uh, Billy the Kid, uh, did uh, your father ever say that anybody else had the same feeling, that Billy the Kid was never killed? Well, I think he did. I don't remember well, but I think that it was these two other two fellas. They talked, of course, they talked it over amongst themselves, yeah. you know, before the, maybe before that night was over. Mm -hmm. Or one asked the other's opinion. And they know each other pretty well. That is him and one of the fellas did, anyway. Okay, so... I don't know about you, but this is another first-hand account from an old-timer whose dad was a colleague of Billy the Kid who knew Pat Garrett and who told his son, and you can tell his son wasn't really into it, didn't ask a lot of questions. But as far as what his son remembers that his dad told him, after the kid escaped Lincoln, he's riding out of town, and Shotgun Collins is riding into town, and they meet about nine miles outside of Lincoln, and he talks to the kid, and that's how he knew where the kid was going. I don't know where Burns got the story that he's an old drunk sleeping in the hay and he heard the Dedrick voice. Maybe that happened. I don't know. But according to Collins' son, his dad saw the kid and spoke to him as he's heading out of town. Thank God we got this man on audio recording. It's another data point that we can consider as we decide what we believe about what happened that night. And Collins' son says that there were three men that buried Billy the Kid. And that the deputies, or at least one deputy, went with them to make sure the body went into the ground and to make sure they didn't look at it. Which explains Garrett's statement that he guaranteed nobody had taken a figure. He made sure the body was in the ground. And I don't know if people know this, but some idiot said one time that Brushy Bill claimed that Garrett went back a years later and dug up the grave to make sure the body was still there. And then he moved it a couple feet and whatever. And they're like, <laughs> Garrett, you Brushy Bill so stupid. He said that happened. <laughs> Brushy Bill never said that. Number one, there is a guy that said that. And his name is Charlie Seringo. And Charlie Seringo in his book says that Garrett went back and dug up the body. So why did he say it? I don't know. Also, a few days after the shooting, newspapers said that other grave robbers had gone and dug up the body and had the kid's skeleton, all this stuff. So if Garrett was concerned about that, which he obviously was because he mentions it in his book, do you think he's going to keep the location a secret and maybe let people have the service in town if there was one, which I don't think there was one? Or do you think he's going to have a graveside service where everybody knows where to go? I don't think at all that Garrett allowed them to have a graveside service, and I don't think that's credible in any way, based on what we know. Don't you think it's more likely that Garrett would have kept the location of secret? Of course he would. Anyway, Collins' son says the deputies went with him to guard, and one of the guys that helped him bury was the guy that Billy the Kid was staying with. Well, that tells me it's Jesus Silva, because Brushy Bill says he ended up staying with Jesus Silva, and other people say he was staying with Jesus Silva. So you got three guys. Shotgun Collins is one. Jesus Silva is the other one. Who's the third person? I think, personally, my opinion is probably Vicente Otero, because he meant, he's mentioned multiple times, and he probably made the coffin. So the only thing that doesn't jive in the story that his son tells is that it was an old Mexican sheep herder that was killed. And I think that Collins just didn't know, because there's a lot of rumors flying around and it was a Mexican sheep herder, but it wasn't an old Mexican sheep herder. It was a young Mexican sheep herder using the name Billy Barlow. Now, again, he says that he didn't open the coffin and look at the body. Shotgun Collins did it. Um, but he could tell that it wasn't Billy the Kid. And I'll leave it to you to go through all these statements. You know, Paco Naya has different pallbearers. Jesus Silva has different pallbearers. Miguel Otero has different pallbearers and people making the coffin. Paco Naya has different people on the coroner's jury. This thing is all jumbled up. So here's my attempt at trying to straighten this out. And I'm going to be the first to admit, this is my personal opinion. But we just went through a lot of confusing information, so I want to share this with you. First, I think it's extremely likely that Shotgun Collins either came with the posse or he met them in Fort Sumner and was in the area. So Garrett shoots an innocent Mexican thinking it's Billy the Kid and freaks out because he knows he could hang for this. Anybody that's in the immediate area, and there's a few people around, 
that does hear the shots comes running to see what's going on. But Garrett won't let anybody close to the body. Word spreads that they've killed Billy the Kid, and Garrett and his posse barricade themselves in the room and don't let anybody see the body. Celsa Gutierrez comes to Billy, who's wounded, and says, you got to get out of here. They're passing off Billy Barlow as you. Frank Lobato goes with him. They go to Paco and I's sheep camp. Next day, Maxwell tells Vicente Otero to make a coffin. He starts working on the coffin. Silva comes over and he tells Silva to go get the Justice of the Peace. He goes to get the Justice of the Peace. And maybe uh, John Collins is digging the grave in the dark because he does say that they were digging the grave in the dark. I don't know. Next morning, daylight's 4.55 a.m. By now, Garrett's already written up his coroner's report and has it ready. While he's waiting for Segura and Silva to get back, Otero's cousin shows up, looks through the door, sees the body, and leaves. Jesus and Segura arrive, and Silva moves the body to a table in the other room while Garrett and Segura talk through what to do next. Garrett gets his signatures and gets out of there, leaving the deputies to make sure nobody looks at the body and it goes into the ground. By now, the body's wrapped in a sheet. They take it across to the carpenter shop and put it in the coffin. They nail it, and off they go. Uh, according to Shotgun Commons, um, he packs it out. So I would say that's probably Silva, Otero, and Shotgun Collins. Um, I don't think Anaya was there at all. I think according to Silva, uh, the kids stayed at their house and he knew him well, uh, but he's eight miles south of Fort Sumner. And unless someone specifically sends for him that night, he wouldn't have gotten the news. Billy uh, was supposedly killed before Billy and Frank Lobato showed up at his house in the middle of the night. I mean, they left at 3 a.m. So I think everything he said is a cover for Billy the Kid. As for Jesus Silva, I think he was Billy's buddy. But I think it's reasonable that Pat Garrett had gotten to him and was trying to use him to set the kid up. I mean, there was a big reward out. And Brushy said and Silva said that he was the one that suggested the kid goes to Maxwell's, which he should definitely know better. Uh, and according to his later statements, he knew dang well Garrett was in town and looking for the kid. So it just seems to me like he was trying to set him up. When he's at Silva's house, uh, he tells Selsa, not the kid. Um, he, I think he's trying to play both sides here. So when Garrett kills the kid, he was already in cahoots with Garrett to set up the kid. Now it switches to protecting Garrett because he's already involved in shady stuff. So he's going to say, look, I, you know, I'll say it's Billy the Kid, no problem. So this is his chance to get out of the middle. He's basically been trying to play both sides. So now he can protect Billy and pretend to be Billy's friend. And he can also protect Garrett and everybody's happy. So he convinces Billy like, yeah, you got to go. Like Garrett's passing this guy off as you. I'll say it's you, whatever. So... So it's not really that the kid and Garrett had an agreement, but it kind of worked out for both of them. And it definitely worked out for Jesus Silva. And really the guy, in my opinion, that comes out smelling like a rose in this is Paco Anaya. Paco was the good guy that had the kids back and basically goes along with the BS story to protect the kid. But he can't help but throw a little doubt in there to make Garrett look bad. So he says that Garrett wrote the thing himself and got a different jury that didn't see the body. So he's not going to say the kid's alive, but he's going to say Garrett didn't do things right, whatever, because he's on the kid's side. This also would explain why Anaya would say that Frank Lobato dug the grave, because he could trust Lobato. He knew Lobato was, you know, on his side. Um, but then later, Lobato says, no, it wasn't me. We already mentioned, but Jesus Silva said Vincente Otero dug the grave, and Shotgun Collins' son said that his dad dug the grave, which is true. Because him and Vincente probably dug it together, I would think. And uh, maybe it was Jesus Silva that built the coffin while they were digging the grave, put the kid's body in, and then off they go. So I understand this is my opinion, and you can choose to believe a different version of events. But I understand that people will say, well, even though the statements are all screwed up and there's a lot of contradictions, still, if you look at the vast majority, everybody said uh, that kid was dead. Why would they lie? So I'm going to end with one last item. And I want to introduce you to a very well-known and very well-respected female historian of the American West. And that woman is Eve Ball. And Eve Ball was an American historian of the American West and a teacher. She is most well-known for her oral research and books on the Apache Native American tribes, particularly her book, Inde and Apache Odyssey, and in 1981, she received the Saddleman's Award, which is considered the Oscar of Western writing for that book. On May 14th, 1969, this lady was interviewed by author Leon Metz, and she shared with Leon Metz what she learned 
from her own interview with the daughter of regulator Frank Coe, Edith Coe. And in that interview with Leon Metz, she shares what Edith Cole told her, which is the following, quote, Mrs. Coe would not allow the Lincoln County War or Billy the Kid to be mentioned in the house, so they never discussed it in the home. Whatever Frank Coe had done in his other life, he was very considerate of his wife. But when he would go out with his daughters, he would point out, this place is where we hanged a Negro, or so on. Well, Edith drove her father down to Roswell after he went into banking. Mr. Coe was pretty affluent. When he went into the bank, John W. Poe saw him, as Poe ended up working as a bank president, coming into the bank and sent a clerk to invite him into his office. Edith went with him, and Frank got to asking what really happened at Fort Sumner the night that Billy the Kid was killed. And Edith said her father never had the slightest doubt but that the kid was killed. You'll hear stories all over the country of how Frank and George Coe would make a trip to Arizona or Montana or somewhere to see some man who claimed to be Billy the Kid. But Edith says that's positively not true. Both her father and George, his cousin, believed that Billy the Kid was killed. They got to talking to Poe that day about this, and Garrett had written his little book, The Death of Billy the Kid, and he had substantiated Pat Garrett's story. But in that office, in front of Edith Coe, he told Frank Coe that day that they had all lied to protect the reputation of a woman. And positively, it was not Paulita Maxwell. What would that have to do with it? Lying to protect a woman? Well, no one went into details, but Billy was evidently there visiting this woman. She was a relative of Maxwell's, but it was not Paulita Maxwell, Pedro's sister. End quote. So, according to Eve Ball, and this is in the historical record, a reputable scholar, she heard this from Edith Coe that John W. Poe told her father in the present in her presence that they all lied to protect a woman's reputation. Was that Celsa Gutierrez, Garrett's sister-in-law? I think it was. And I'll tell you what else I think. I think if you have questions about what happened in Fort Sumner on July 14th, 1881, that means you're smart because none of these statements make sense. And don't let anybody tell you that because you have questions, you're an idiot or a hoaxer or any of that nonsense. These people should be completely ignored. These are the people that don't disclose that Delavita Maxwell said she wasn't there. And they ignore testimony from Severo Gallegos and Manuel Taylor, whose stories make perfect sense. And accept without reservation the convoluted stories that I just shared with you that all contradict each other. So do you want to know why people lied about what happened in Fort Sumner? I think there's a lot of reasons. According to John Poe, it was to protect a woman's integrity and reputation. I think for Garrett and his supporters, it was to prevent Garrett's own hanging. I think for Billy's friends, it was a chance to give him a new life. All of this makes sense and is supported by items and evidence and testimony in the historical record. But now, if you want to ask me, why do people today still lie about it 140 years later? I guess that's up for them to tell you because I don't understand it myself. This has been a long one, but I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for listening.